Well, good morning, everyone. Today is 7 June, the year 2004. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Colonel Chet Patterson. Colonel Patterson was a fighter pilot in Europe during World War II, flying P-38s and P-51s with four confirmed victories. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Nice to have you here, Colonel. Nice to meet you. Now, first of all, can you tell me when and where were you born? I was born in Berkeley, California, way back in 1920. And what was the uh, date of your birth date? January 24th, 1920. Okay. I hate to say that. <laughs> okay. Um, would you uh, spell your full name for me, too, please? Chet Patterson, C H E T A, I use A. Patterson, P A T T E R S O N. And uh, what was your father's name? George Patterson. And where uh, where did he um, where did he come from? How did you get? Well, to, you all get to where I'm a third generation Californian, which is fairly rare. But my forefathers or foreparents, I guess you'd say, were involved with the Whitman massacre. They came over with the Donner Party, and uh, Whitman was the leader of the party my folks were in, and he got in an argument with the Donner group, and they left them. They, they had come over about halfway out here, and um, so anyway, the uh, Wisman party went up north, and they, they made it to the to uh, Walla Walla, Washington. Oh. Uh, I should say they made it tentatively because um, after about a year, the Indians had a raid and killed everybody but the little children. And fortunately, uh, one of those childs was my particular relative. And um, they, the, the girls were, uh, the Indians sold them to the Hudson Bay Company. The Hudson Bay Company brought them to San Francisco. And that's where my family started. So my father, uh, he was the second generation to, to come here. What was the name of the person that survived that massacre? Do you recall? I don't remember the, the, her, the, the, the daughter that I was related to, her first name, but Saunders was the name. He was the teacher uh, in the uh, Whitman party. And uh, strangely enough, the Indians, had, they liked him. So they had come to him the day before the uh, massacre and said, whatever you do now, don't don't go out of the house tomorrow. And he thought that was very strange, but they said, just stay there. No matter what happens, stay there. Well, when the massacre started, he was typical, I think. That's where I get my scotch that involved with a lot of fights. So um, anyway, he went out in, into the fight and was killed. And when he, his wife saw him being uh, massacred, uh, why she ran out and she was also killed and had told the three daughters to stay in the house. So anyway, that's why I'm here. I guess. Well, how, how old were the daughters at that time? Do you they were about, uh, oh, probably eight, six, and four, something like that. Uh -huh. They were very young. How many were in that party? How many were killed? In the, oh, they killed everybody except I think there was six children, six or eight children that survived. So how many how many were in the party total? I would say there was probably eighty something like that. And so that was back like in before they got to California before they oh, split yeah. off. Yeah. Well, it was the same time as the Donner Party because um, they had come across the, the planes planes um, with the Donner Party until the two uh, two leaders got in an argument. And so where did that fam where your family where did they originate where did they do you remember where back east they that came? I really don't know I, I I never really realized I think the Saunders the the, the, the original Saunders the father came from Scotland uh -huh. yeah. okay 
Um, so, and yeah, and so your father was okay. The the girl that was saved, she was she your grandmother then? Like? That was my father's grandmother. Oh, okay, your great grandmother. Yeah. And so, um, so, and where, where did you grow up again, did you say? Well, or, or in a sense, I, I, I grew up mostly in Pleasanton, California. I went from the first year in, in grammar school all through high school in Pleasanton, California. Prior to that, my father, um, I was conceived in, in uh, Knights Ferry, California, and they had no doctors or no... Okay medical facilities and so forth. And so my mother came down to Berkeley to deliver me there at the Alta Bates Hospital in Berkeley, California, which was her family home. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, Pleasanton, is that in Marin County? or where No, Pleasanton it? is uh, 30 miles really due east from San Francisco. Okay. You're just over the, the hills uh -huh. and to the first valley past the hills. And uh, what was your mother's uh, name, her maiden name? Her maiden name was Teg. And her first name? And her first name was Cora, Cora Teg. And where, what about her uh, background, her family? Well, she was born in Berkeley, California. Uh, she came from a family of six, and all of them were born there. My grandfather, her, or her father, uh, had come over as an Irish immigrant, I guess, and uh, in his young days, went into the uh, Alaskan um, gold rush and uh, fared very poorly. And uh, when he got up there, he, he couldn't find any gold, I guess. So uh, he became a, a plumber because everybody needed plumbers up there. So um, anyway, that's he started a plumbing business. And then when he came back to Berkeley, he started the the Phil Tate plumbing business with his son. And uh, I remember my grandfather, uh, he was a wonderful little tiny guy. He was almost the size of a jockey. But uh, he was a wiry little guy <laughs> and did very well. Um, did you have any brothers and sisters? No, I had no brothers and sisters. And what, what kind of work did your father do? Well, he started out as, as a farmer. Uh, ended up as an ag teacher in high school and a coach. So I was always um, had a lot of coaching as a young guy. Did he go to college then? Yeah, he went to the University of California and then uh, finished at Davis for his senior year. What, did he play sports before he started coaching? No, he was a boxer at Cal. Oh. Well, I, I said that's a sport, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking of football, basketball. Right, yeah. But uh, no, he boxed at Cal. He was the heavyweight champion there at Cal when he was there. He was a bigger guy than I was. Did you like boxing? Did he teach you how to? Well, yeah, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> he taught me how to defend myself. And of course, you learn a little bit about more than just defending. But anyway, I boxed at Cal too when oh, I was did. there. You know. But the nice thing about that is you, in boxing is one sport where you're always equal, in a sense, in, in size, legitimate size, boxing, size. because you're fighting at 155 pounds, which is what I did, and nobody's lighter than, say, five pounds less than you or yeah. five pounds more than you. Was that a middleweight or welterweight? Did you welterweight. Yeah. welterweight yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you follow the um, the boxers of the time? I mean, did you follow boxing? Uh, did yeah. you have some favorite uh, fighters? One of my... One of my uh, I guess he was a, he was a family uncle, not a, not really a blood uncle, but he was a very close friend of my grandfather's. And um, his the, the three the three of my grandfather Jack Kitchen and James Day, J Corbett were all buddies. Really, and uh, oh, gentlemen, I have a gentlemen, lot of pictures gentlemen. of them, you know, with family barbecues and stuff. Oh, gentleman Jim Corbett. Yeah. So, and did you ever meet him? Did you ever meet I never met him. No, no, he died I, uh -huh. before I was young enough to really realize what it was all about. Yeah. Uh -huh. How about when you were 
fighting or in college? Do you remember some of the good welterweights fighting in the well, country? Well, I remember one in particular that I lost. That's oh. why I remember it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, the boxing coach didn't tell me. And the fellow came out and he was a left-hander. And boy, he hit me with his left and I thought, that is the toughest <laughs> left-hander <laughs> I've ever met, you know. Well, I was dizzy from there on, and uh, he didn't knock me out, but uh, I finished the fight, but I really didn't know what was going on. I was did, just protecting Did you myself. have a head, head, head uh, no, uh, protection no, at all? Not at that time. Oh, really? I think they put it in later. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, you, I think you probably kind of grew up during the Depression. Uh, what, what was that like for you and your family? Well, the, the, the Depression, of course, I was quite young. You know, that was, uh, say, in the late 20s after the, the crash and then the early 30s. And at that time, I was, you know, 12, 15. Prior to that time, we really never had any problem. We didn't have any money either. I also have to say I learned one thing that I thought to myself, I will never, ever buy anything on time. <laughs> because I can remember my folks as a youngster, they said, well, we paid off the refrigerator, now what can we buy, you know? But they were always buying something always on time. And I thought, I'm never going to do that. Because there was a lot of family discussion about, you know, where the money was going to go and what has to be paid and so forth. So anyway, one of my ambitions was that Someday I'm going to buy a Cadillac and I'm going to buy it, you know, not on time. <laughs> so anyway, when I finally could buy one, uh, I decided I wasn't going to buy one. I was going to buy a Mercedes. So I had to work a little longer, <laughs> a step, a step a little higher. Do you remember the first car that your family had or that you can remember? Yeah, I remember uh, my dad lived a very country life in a sense. We did a lot of hunting and fishing, a lot of fishing. My dad and an uncle that I was named after, and myself, we used to go back in the hills in the Sierras, back behind Sonora. And we'd live for 30 days with just a gun, fishing rod, and you know, flies, or we didn't use bait at all. And uh, we lived off the ground, you know. We, we wanted some meat, we shot a rabbit or something like that, and um, we ate a lot of fish, I'll tell you. That was before the fish days, sort of. We ate a lot of fish, and I can always remember one time, and we'd been out there about 20 days, I guess, and here comes a doctor and a pack, couple pack animals and so forth, and uh, so I was, I was probably 13 at the time, something like that. And we, we went over to visit their camp, and they were cooking a big piece of ham with a bone in it. You know, and I looked at that and I thought, oh boy, if I could only have that, and to, even to this day, I, I can still remember how, how great that looked in a frying pan. And I can only remember as soon as I got back home, I told my mom, I said, I want a big piece of ham with a bone in it. So, but, um, it was a it was a wonderful experience for me, it really was. And uh, my dad and, and this uncle of mine and myself, the three of us built two fairly big cabins all by ourselves. Yeah. And uh, I got a lot of experience in working. And by that time, I think I was about sixteen or so. Um, did you have odd jobs and things growing up? Yeah, I worked on a cattle ranch all through high school. Um, some friends of ours, my folks, uh, had a son that went to a little tiny school, a little one, one room school in Tassajara, California. And um, the mother said, you know, he's not used to any boys his age, or even girls. In the school, I think there was only about 10 people in the school, and they went through the, you know, the kindergarten through uh, eighth grade in, in grammar school. 
And uh, so they asked if I could come and play with them. And uh, I, was, I was a freshman in high school at that time. So my mother said, sure, you know, that'll, that'll work. So anyway, they put me out there every summer in this cattle ranch, and we punched cattle, and I rode horses yeah. every day, and milked cows in the morning and evening, and so forth. But it was a great country life. I had, as a youngster, uh, I have to say, we were poor, but for me, it was a wonderful life. I never realized we were poor. Yeah. Never did. Now, did you uh, did you live out in the country or live in town? Your we lived right in town. Yeah, okay. my dad lived right in town. And that was in Pleasanton. Pleasanton. Yeah. Okay. How big was Pleasanton then? Pleasanton was. I can remember these numbers because uh, I heard them a lot. But when I went there, the town was total sixteen hundred people, and I think they counted a few sheep and. and <laughs> pigs and a couple of other things, but it was really a small country town. What is it now? But God, what a wonderful life. Now it's probably maybe 75,000. Well, I was in the only high school they had, and the high school that I went to, Amador High School they called it, but it was in Pleasanton. They, um, to fulfill the, the school, they had a bus that they sent to Sonola and one to Dublin that brought the kids there into to Amador High School. So the, the, three towns actually supplied Amador High School. And um, now they have two full big high schools, you know. And uh, where'd you go to grammar school? In Pleasanton, yeah. Okay. And it was called Pleasanton? Or yeah, something like Pleasanton, that. yeah. Um, did you play any sports in high school? Yeah, I played. Well, in those days, you know, my dad was the coach, so I, in a sense, we had to play everything. So we played football, baseball, and basketball. Did he coach all those? Uh, yeah, he all coached those, everything. Those, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what position did you play? Like, uh, well, in um, in football, I played center. And then I was the kicker, and I got a scholarship to the University of California as a kicker because, uh, again, my dad really used to spend a lot of time training me. And uh, on each sport... Place kicking and punting? Place kicking and punting, punting mostly. Uh -huh. But um, uh, it was wonderful for me because uh, each sport we had he would teach me, you know, for my ability, the best things. And I was the catcher in, in, in the baseball because he thought that was an important part of the game is for a catcher that controls like the quarter. quite a bit of the game, you know, and so forth. And then in basketball, I had a hard time because I'm a little guy. But uh, he said, well, then to make up, you got to got to practice shooting so we used to go and he'd do office work and so forth in the school and he'd give me the basketball and he said now shoot till you you know till you hit five in the foul line and five in the outside circle and the right left and back and so forth and uh, so I got away with playing against bigger guys because I could shoot. Would you have two hands set shot? Yeah, in those days, yeah. Yeah, no, no one-handed stuff yeah. like they do. Was that Hank Lucetti, I think, was like the first guy. Well, he was he was before me. I mean, yeah. after, after me. I know he was, yeah. right, yeah. So I remember I should him. say he, before me. I think yeah. he played at Stanford or somewhere. Yeah. And it was the, yeah. yeah. Um, in punting, um, what's important? Keeping the nose up on the ball or what's... Uh, well, your whole setup, if you're, if you're really a good punter, it really starts... At the time, the second you receive that ball from the, the center, because there's it's a it's a what they call a two and a half step kick, because the two and a half steps, three steps, you might be just too blocked. far and get blocked, you know. So two and a half steps, you can get that kick off usually before they can get to you, and um, so it was very important to to be set up in the right way. That, Everything worked, and it had to work just like clockwork. It had to be just a habit. You know, it's not you don't do it and pay attention to it. It's just a habit that you do after a lot of practice. 
um, and place kicking, you were straight on, not the yeah. side, yeah. Not like the yeah. side step. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you have a little square thing on the t on your toe, on the kicking toe? I had, yeah, I had a square toe. I remember because yeah. when I played, yeah, I think I they had, had that toe. too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, of course, in the summertime, you were on the ranch. Now, during the during the year, did you have uh, close friends, and what did you guys do for recreation and stuff? Like when you're not playing sports in school, is there anything particularly you'd like to do? Well, uh, Pleasanton was really a wonderful place to live, and we did we did a lot of things. But they were all fun things and happy things. And this is what I, you know, don't like today when I read about drive-by shooting and stuff like that. We never had anything like that. We had, I had, I had, I think at least five or more fights when I was in school. But you know, you fought it out barehanded, and if you won. You know, you won, and if you lost, you lost. But you didn't go kick the guy in the head when he was on the ground or anything like that. We never did anything like that. You know. But a lot of the things were just fun. I remember each year we used to always try to do something special for Halloween, you know. And uh, I remember one year we, we picked up a guy's Model T Ford, picked it up. It was about must have been four guys on each side. Picked it up and jammed it between a telephone pole and the guy wire that was on the ground, you know, to support it. And, you know, he couldn't back up. It was really tight against that thing. So it was had to be left there for a couple of days because they had to figure out how to get, it, to get the damn thing out. Finally, somebody told him, well, those kids all picked it up and carried it. So then they got a bunch of us over there to say, all right, now you got to pick it up and take it out of there. <laughs> but yeah. you used to have little fun things like that. that Just create your own. That were really good fun. Yeah. Um, so what year did you graduate from high school then? 37. Okay, and you got a scholarship, a football scholarship for well, a Well, I game. was offered there, but I didn't, oh, I didn't, didn't take, take that. Oh. I didn't take that. I, I felt I was too small to play college football. And what was your major in college? Mechanical engineering at the University of California. <laughs> In Berkeley, had you always liked drawing and stuff like that, or? Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I really did. I, I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, I, I went. I was. I had done three years before I got called into the Air Force. And in those days, you know, you had to have at least two years of college. Mm -hmm. But my dad was pressing me. He said, "There's going to be a war, and you want to be an officer." And um, so. You know, he sent me to CMTC when I was just 16. And what is that? Well, it was at that time they don't have it anymore. But it was called Citizens Military Training Camp, and it was for 30 days in the summertime. And you went to a place. I was assigned to the Presidio in San Francisco, and there was about oh, I guess um, 150, maybe 200 young people like myself. But you went there for 30 days, and then we had we had World War One uniforms. I had, you know, britches with with uh, God, I can't even remember the name of it now. Puttees, right? To wrap around and, and then their shoes, you know. And uh, <laughs> I have a picture at home with a with a gun and standing there uh, at ease, supposedly, and. Uh, it was a wonderful experience for me. I really enjoyed it. And of course, I had fun too because we were shooting there and that was just, that was easy for me. That was nothing. For me. Remember what your first gun was when you were hunting? Well, I started out, my, my dad, my dad, he, he was a national champion. I mean, he was good. And he used to go back to Camp Perry every year and it was a case of whether he represented the, the reserve program Military, militarily, or the California uh, club. I forget. Had your dad was. had your dad been in the military? Yeah, yeah. He 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 retired out as a as a major. Was he in during World War One? He was a well. He's a rear guy. He was on in one, and came out as a captain, and then uh, he raised so much hell uh, 
uh, when World War II started, that uh, he got him, he got the senator to sponsor him, and they took him in. You know, he was way past where he should be. Uh -huh. School teacher, you know, wasn't supposed to go to, and uh, so he went back into the service. And uh, so when I met him overseas, because they sent him, they ended up sending him overseas. <laughs> He was fighting the whole damn war. And so when I finally was over there just before D-Day, I flew over. And at that time, I was a major, and he was a captain. And he had to salute me. <laughs> I got a big kick out of that because that's a, the first time I ever overpowered my dad. <laughs> oh, God. That was funny. That was funny. But anyway, oh, another little funny story about that. My dad decided... When the war was over, he was going to stay over because he could speak German pretty well, and um, he thought there was some job to do and so forth. So then he called for my mother to come over. So my mother thought, "Oh boy, that's a good deal." So she gets gets on a boat in, in uh, New Jersey or someplace back east. He goes over there, and it has all the whole boat. The whole boat has a crew and a doctor and so forth. Otherwise, they're all women going to see their husbands overseas. And they get in one of the worst Atlantic storms there ever was, see. And my mother says, here's the piano in the, ball, the big ballroom. And it goes smashing on this side. And the ship had come over, smashed down here. Pretty soon it was just all little pieces <laughs> sliding across the floor. But everything was broken. But, but a lot of the girls, uh, I mean, they really were hurt, including my mother. But they had broken arms and this and that. So here all the, uh, the guys come down to meet the boat, you know, and here the women come out with with all kinds of crutches and a wheelchair and so forth. And my dad says, you know, it really was funny because, it, not at the time, but when he thought about it, that they were, all these women were hurt, they were like combat. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so you go to the CM, uh, so you, do, well, I was getting back, do you recall your, the first, um, uh, well, the first guy, hunting, hunting, well, hunting. the first guy I had was a little, a little double barrel shotgun, it was a little tiny thing, and it had a, a spring on it that, that cast these little wooden pellets, and, um, so there was, a, my dad gave it to me, you know, that was my best Christmas. In those days, we were poor, and I got one Christmas present each year. That's all, one. So this is my Christmas present. So anyway, everybody now goes back in the kitchen and the, that area of the house, and I got this little shotgun, and I was trying it out. So I put the pellets in there and shoot a pellet, and I thought, boy, that works out pretty good. So I'm going to see if I can get some of these Christmas ornaments. Well, I should. I damn near broke all the Christmas ornaments and Jesus, my mother was going to kill me. And she just, you, George, you got to take this gun away from that kid. He's going to, you know, ruin the whole house. And, uh, but I'll never forget that. But then I went from there to a BB gun and then a pump BB gun. And uh, then a 22, and then finally up to the 30 odd 6 Did you hunt any big game? No, well, my, my dad always pressed on me that don't, don't shoot any, well, the rule was if you shot something, you ate it. Right. That's what and did. so he said, you know, you just don't shoot for the fun of it. And um, so anyway, I always lived by that rule. So I used to go shoot jackrabbits and right. stuff that we could eat and always brought them home. Yeah. And you never wasted anything, you know. When we went out to, to shoot like dove or quail, something like that, you shot maybe three or four, which they're little birds, you know. You, you don't eat one bird and that's dinner. You'd eat four of them, you know, for dinner or something like that. But you never just shoot a, you know, a whole bunch of them. Right. Yeah. Um, do you remember, well, let's talk about a little bit about your... Uh, 
So did you go out for the boxing team as soon as you got to Cal? Well, I didn't make the boxing team, but they, they have they had uh, what they call intramural boxing there at Cal. And I did that for the three years I was there, and I enjoyed it. Do you remember what you were doing December 7th, 1941? Sure do. I was an ABA. I went in, I signed up. Well, I got to tell you the story of how I got there. My dad kept saying, you've got to be an officer. And you've got, he says, I know there's going to be a war. There's going to be a war. You better sign up for it. So my fourth, starting my fourth year at the University of California, Berkeley, I went over to Eshelman Hall. And they, they, that's where kind of everybody met and so forth before class. To them. And it was an Army Air Force recruiter there. So anyway, I uh, go over and talk to him. And I said, geez, you know, my dad wants me to go in the military. And I said, well, what's the deal? Oh, he says, we got, we got a great deal here in the Air Force. You sign up if you got at least two years in college. You sign up. If you flunk out of flying school, then we'll, we'll send you to officer's candidate school. You don't just go out, you know. And he says, that's the best deal, you know. I, I can't believe it. And I thought, boy, that's really good because I had never been to an airport, never been to an in, close to an airplane other than seeing it fly in the sky. So anyway, with my dad putting me pressure to say, you know, you got to do something because I know there's going to be a war. So anyway, this guy says, well, as soon as you graduate, we'll call you up. So you can't ask for a better deal than that. And then you don't have to worry about any draft or anything because you can say, you know, you're on this list. So I thought, boy, that's a good deal. So I signed up, so forth. Go home that weekend to Pleasanton, which is, I say, only 30 miles away from Berkeley, and uh, told my dad, and he says, oh, he says, that is really a good idea. That's, that's really a good idea, because if you flunk out, you go to officer's cream in the school. But he says, you know, I'm surprised you signed up for the Air Force, because he says, you didn't even like to climb a three-strand barbed wire fence. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, well, this is different, you know, the, he said, the flying is really fun. So anyway, I signed up for it. Now, 10 days later, my mother calls me and she says, you got a letter here at the house, and uh, would you like me to open it and read it to you? I says, oh, sure. It says, report in 10 days. <laughs> so anyway, I had to quit school and uh, went there, and, and uh, they shipped me down to Tex Rankin's uh, primary school in T Tulare, California. And, um, well, I got to tell you the first day, we, we arrive, arrive in the bus, and they said, you know, you've got to buy a suit. This is before the war. You need a suit, three sets of underwear, a couple of other things, and toilet articles. So I never had a suit. We didn't have that much money. I <laughs> never needed a suit. So I even went, went and bought a suit, and then the guy said, now look at it. He says, this is the latest fashion. He said, this is absolutely perfect, but you never button the suit. It's just, hangs just perfect, but you don't button it. Don't button it. Don't, don't do that, because it'll pull and design it. But it's designed. This is the latest design, so I wanted the latest design. So I buy the suit, get off the bus, and the sergeant comes up to me and says, button that damn suit. You know? Well, he said, you know, button the suit. Well, <laughs> Suits like this. Well, in three days before we got our uniform, my suit was all stretched out, <laughs> ruined, totally ruined. But anyway, when I got it, when I got out of the bus, and I say, and then the sergeant, boy, he spotted that blue suit right away. So now they said, okay, line up. You all line up here, and you're gonna line up by height. So you know, I'm way down, down the line of ways, and. A little squall comes up, and they were all just upperclassmen that were flying. And a little California squall comes up, and Jesus, all of a sudden, you know, here's flares going out. Jesus, we're young, you know, we, me, I didn't know anything. So, what, what is, what's that? So, well, and, and that is, you know, they didn't have radios in them, so when they see the flares, they're supposed to come down and land. So, so they come down and land, all these upperclassmen which we were impressed with the upperclassmen. Boy, that's something. 
and half of them ground loops. <laughs> and she said, we thought, boy, if the upperclassmen, they ground them, they crash them. You know, this is tough. This is going to be tough to learn to do this. And it was really a lot of excitement for us, you know. But I'll never forget that. How that tall, was my first day. How tall were you? Or how? Five eight. But, you know, I have to laugh a little when after I went to the Unions after the war, and from the 55th Fighter Group, literally we're all 5'8". It was really funny that that was the fighter group size, you know. Yeah. And a couple of tall ones came like you, but but most of most of us were all 5'8", just about. <laughs> but it was a wonderful. I I have to say, I there was no question in my mind that I was the luckiest guy in the Air Force. Everything went my way. I had an unbelievable experience. I mean, really, it's unbelievable. You can't even imagine what it was like. Did flying come easy to you? Oh, yeah. Well, I ended up, uh, again, with my dad's training and preparation for everything that I did. Um, I went out and I really worked hard at flying. I mean, I loved it. I, I, I loved it after a while. I, lo I really loved it. As soon as I sold it, I really loved it. But I really went out and worked hard. And it was wonderful here in California. You have those cumulus clouds, you know. And you could, you could go just to the edge of them and then try to cut in and so forth. And then if you made a mistake or whatever it was, and you ended up in the clouds, you know, you, you always came out right away anyway. So you never got in trouble. But I could practice doing maneuvers and, and things that I thought really uh, improved my skills. Because if you go up there and fly in just a blue sky, you don't know what you did because there's nothing to compare. Mm -hmm. But when you have that cloud and you've got to just shave it by the edge from this turn, you know, and not fly into it, but just shave at the edge or something else that you do, you can judge whether you did it good or bad or indifferent or did it what you wanted to do. And uh, that really helped me a lot. And of course, when I finally got in fighters, it was the same thing, just like boxing. I always wanted to tangle with somebody. I used to always go there and take them head on and waggle my wings, and that was that was our signal for, I want to fight. And if he wiggled his wings back, then you started, you know, a little combat. And uh, I was bound and determined I was going to beat everybody, you know. And by that time, excuse me, I really worked hard at it. So how long were you in Tulare then? Well, uh, you were always in, the, in the class for uh, whether it's primary, basic or advanced, three months. You're, you're half of that time, you're a lower classman, and half the time you're upper classman. Can I tell you one funny, funny story about upper and lower classmen? All my upper classmen, when we finally got to know them, were all from the south, or the, the, the south east. And most of all my class was from California, Oregon, and Washington, and a few from Texas. Well, they, they, they kept asking us when, when we first got there, you know, who won the Civil War? Well, for me in California, you know, I didn't pay much attention to the Civil War other than reading it in books because we weren't in the fight, literally. And, um, you know, the, we said the, the, the North won it. They said the South won it. You, when I asked you that, you tell me the South won it. Well, that was kind of a pain in the neck to me, you know. I didn't want to get involved in that Civil War. I didn't think it was that funny. So when when we got to be upperclassmen, uh, there's a couple of other little stories I should have told you, but by this time, because of my CMT training, another fellow and myself are the head guys of our class, you know, he was he was the commander, cadet commander, and I was the assistant 
cadet commander. And I told him, I said, you know, I don't want to do, have anything like this Civil War thing. I think that really stumped. We're going to have to do something to our class, our lower class when we're upper classmen. I want to do something else that's fun, you know, so forth. Well, the first day, you know, they strip you down and you go to, you're, everybody's naked, everybody's naked. And we go in there and we're all lined up. And um, so anyway, I, I said, now what we're going to do is when they all go to the gym and they strip everybody down, we'll set up a table in front of where the doctors are and so forth. And we'll, we'll get a printed uh, questionnaire on sex. You know, when is the first time he had sex? You know, how many times and this and that and the other thing? And have them all fill it in. We'll just see what happens with that. That's that's our joke with it. So sure enough, that's what we did. Well, we gathered, you know, the, the doctors, they were busy with the, the shooting shots and this and that and the other. And so anyway, we gathered up the papers and take them into our room that night and read them. And there was an absolute riot to read them. We really got a kick out of it. I still have to laugh about it when I think about it. But I thought it was a good joke. But, you know, talking about that day when they stripped you down, I always remember when I got in the line, they we were all stripped down there. And so we're, and you're right alongside the guy coming the other way. And the doctor's shooting him, you know, with some inoculation of some kind. And once in a while they missed or something and there was a little bit of blood coming down. And I had looked at that and, you know, when you uh, brand cattle, you know, it's a little tough. It's a little tough for some people because you, when you're dehorning them and so forth, there's quite a bit of blood going around sometimes. And then, Jesus, when you're branding them, there, you know, there's this odor and some burnt hair and so forth. And uh, you kind of get used to it. But there's a lot of guys, you know, that they've never seen anybody because, you know, when, they, when somebody did it to them, they're turning the other way. You had to look at it. They wanted you to look at it. And sure enough, two or three guys passed out. Boom. They were out of the cadets because they figured, hey, if that little thing bothers them, we don't want them in an airplane either as a fighter pilot or a bomber pilot, either way. If he passes out by himself, that's bad. And if he passes out with other guys, that's bad too. And it was kind of interesting, but you know there was a reason for it. Yeah. And sure enough, uh, you know, they, our, we had a couple of our guys passed out. They carted them right off. They were out of the cadet program. But uh, anyway, I, I really had a wonderful experience about it. I, I think about it and all the things that I did. And because I think I did a good job in P-38s and P-51s, I had a colonel that I used to work for, when General Doodle wanted another fighter pilot, he said, bring Patterson up here. So I ended up on General Doodle's staff. And, um, you know, that, that was an unbelievable assignment. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Let's, let, I want to kind of, let's finish up your training here first. Um, so those different, uh, your primary, your basic, your advanced, were they all at the same place or did you no. go different places? No, where, you, where, go, where, you go where literally did you go? three months to each place. Tulare was the first one. Merced was the second one, which was a basic trainer. And um, that's a low-wing airplane, a BT-13 they call them, basic trainer. And um, when did you f first solo? Oh, I, f I soloed in... Oh, it seems to me about maybe four or five hours. I mean, not oh, very long. Oh, not very okay. long. Yeah. And what plane was that? And that was in the Sturman, PT-17. Yeah. Wonderful little airplane. Oh, yeah. and wonderful wing. And I had a wonderful deal, too, because Tex Rankin, which you probably didn't know her. I've heard that name. But, uh, Tex Rankin, at that time, was the number one stunt pilot in the whole United States. And um, he did a lot of the stuff for the movies and did a beautiful job. And I saw him at the World's Fair in San Francisco in 37. 
he used to do acrobatics, and, and he really, he was marvelous. Well, he brought all of his old buddies to the, the, to the, to be instructors when he started, because it's a civilian school. We only had, as I say, about uh, maybe seven military people on the whole base. Commander, two test pilots, and about five sergeants that were hassling us about marching. But uh, uh, it was a wonderful experience, and we moved from there and then to the, to the BT-13. Uh, and then it broke my heart when I went to Advanced, which was at McClellan Air Force Base in Sacramento, they put me in two, in, two engine 18 irons. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna be a bomb pilot. I, oh, I, can't, I can't believe this. And the whole time in Advanced, you know, you're flying nice and gentle in this turn and so forth, taking it easy, and no acrobatics like I had. And I, I just, I was going crazy. And I kept telling my t instructor, I said, you know, I want to be a fighter pilot. i got to be a fighter pilot. I mean, I want to be a fighter pilot. How can I do it in this thing? I mean, this is crazy. And sure enough, out of about 150 of my class at McClellan, they took eight guys, and I was one of them, to go in P-38s. And oh, was I happy. <laughs> what a happy, happy guy I was. Oh, and they think you, do you think they did because they thought you had the aptitude for it or just luck of the draw? No, I think my instructor said this guy is an eager guy and really wants to be a fighter pilot and I think he'd be a good one, you know, or at least I hope he said that. Yeah. And so where did you go from there at that uh, training? Well, when I, uh, in advance I went to McClellan up there by Sacramento and then from there they sent me right up to uh, Portland Air Base. Uh, where they were just switching to P-38s, just yeah. switching. This, this might be a good time to, why don't you grab that pencil there, and I'll, we'll take a look at that P-38 over there, and you can talk a little bit about it if you would. Yeah. Well, you know, th this, uh, this to me is a really a beautiful airplane. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a, an exquisite looking airplane. It is a wonderful plane to fly. If you know a little bit about torque, in almost any airplane, and especially single-engine airplanes. This has no torque in it at all because each prop is counter-rotating and it cancels itself. So it flies like an arrow. It really flies like an arrow. The only thing was when, when I first started flying, nobody could get out of the airplane in trouble. Everybody in the old days used to get out here on the wing and then jump. And then when they jump, they would just hit this tail, and it would literally cut them in half or kill them or, or break, you know, a couple of legs, both legs, you know, and really, they, they'd come out of there in terrible shape. And then finally, somebody tried it after hearing all about the trouble of jumping out. When he came out of the canopy here, he'd pop this canopy and roll down the window, and then he just slid down laid down on the wing and let the wind push him off and it, he fell down below the, the tail and um, you know and that, that was just like a newborn baby when that word got out that that's you can do it and it was successful the uh, it was very exciting and um, but prior to that you know everybody was really afraid to jump out of it literally and I don't blame them but um, for me, it was an unbelievable airplane to fly. I really, it was a wonderful airplane to fly. And the reliability of the two engines when you one failed to get home, which you could do, and I did it a couple times. But I remember I got to do a lot of exhibition flying in the P-38s for any time a senator or congressman or somebody would come to to uh, Payne Field up there, my, uh, the boss would always say, now put on a demonstration. And uh, 
one of the big rules in those days at the, at the time, and including from Lockheed, they said don't turn into a dead engine. You always kept the power below you. If you turn into a dead engine and for all of a sudden you had to have put on power, it really threw you right over and would throw you into the ground. And um, upstairs, I mean, with a fair amount of altitude, I experimented a lot of times cutting off the engine and doing things with it. And then when I, you know, got to know it pretty well, I used to put on this exhibition. I come across the field with both both engines going, and um, you know, really buzz the the deck. I mean, I'm talking about really low. And then I'd pull up. In the process of pulling up, I'd switch off one engine, feather it, come across the field, and buzz it again with one engine. And then turn the other way, come around, and turn into the dead engine, come in and with the dead engine on the low side, do the same thing, and and land it with you know, in the one engine, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the, I have to say that was pretty impressive because even the congressman, you know, said, well, geez, that's got to be a good airplane. But I was very careful doing it, and I had practiced it plenty of times up in the clouds. And that's, uh, I did the same thing when I did a loop off the ground one time. I had practiced and practiced and practiced on a cloud. And when I did a loop up there in the air and came down and came through the cloud, I said, eh, I'm doing something wrong. I got to change something, you know. And I'd do it again, do it again, and do it until then. Finally, I could do it and never miss. And uh, so, anyway, I used to do a little exhibition up in Fort Angeles every Sunday for all the civilians. Yeah. And uh, that's what I used to do: is take a loop off the deck and slow roll off the deck and so forth. But. Uh, it's a lot of practice, a lot of work, and you know what you're doing, and you don't fudge on what's important. <laughs> but anyway, going back to this B-38, it's it was really a wonderful airplane for me, and I I had I think a lot of hours in it compared to a lot of people, but I think I must have had about 800 uh, hours in the B-38. Tell me uh, about oh, go ahead. You know, that's right. But uh, anyway, I, I did fly combat, and I finished my tour. Okay, let's talk about the armament on the uh, P-38. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, show me the, where your guns were, what kind you had. Well, you had, you had uh, five machine guns and one little 20-millimeter cannon. I think later on they took the cannon out of there. But it was all concentrated right here. And... So when, when they really zeroed in the, the armament, it was perfect. It really was shooting almost like a barrel of bullets in just a small place. So when you hit an airplane, with, with it, when, when you were shooting at it and hit it, you really packed a big wallop. I mean, it was really a big wallop. Whereas the, the airplane, when, like on the 51 or some other, airplanes that's in the wing, there's a, a critical point where all this, the armament zeroes in at one spot has to and then disappears again. So if you're short of that spot or long of that spot, you're only going to get maybe one gun or, or something, even though you're a good shot, you only might, might get one gun to, to really hit it. Whereas on this thing, you're powering in there with five and five machine guns and a cannon it's it's really a wallop, I'll tell you. And tactics-wise, uh, were the tactics used in P-38 different than, let's say, the P-51? Very different, actually, very different. The poor P-38, it had one club foot, in a sense, in that if you got on somebody's tail, and, they, and the Germans learned this fairly soon, I shot down four airplanes in the first two months and never shot another one down even though I got that on the guy's tail from there on because the Germans found out that we could not dive that airplane. You could not dive it. But anyway, uh, the... Uh, 
And the reason for that? Well, the reason is you got into buffeting. When you went straight down, and as soon as it started buffeting, you couldn't get out of it. I mean, you you couldn't get out of the buffeting, and it would the airplane would start either tearing itself apart, or you know you just auger right in because you couldn't pull it out. You just couldn't pull it out. So I mean, four other airplanes, at least, and probably even more than that. I could work my way to get on somebody's tail. Then as soon as I got in tail, when they found that out, they would just roll it over and go straight down. And you you took you had, you could roll it over and take one little, you know, maybe thirty second burst of it at it at the best, and then you had to pull out, let them go. You had to let them go. And it was that that was a crime. Where the the P fifty one. If you wanted to go straight down, you could go straight down. Well, okay, let's talk about the P-51 while we're at it. Which is there. Tell me a little bit about uh, about that plane. Well, it was it was a wonderful airplane to fly, and it had a, and a nice. Was it faster? It was faster than the P-38. I I I couldn't tell myself other than what you read in the book. Um, I couldn't tell whether it was yeah. faster or not. I really. Uh, they were both fast. They were both fast, and uh, but it's a fun little airplane to fly. I really, I have to say, I enjoyed it. And of course, in advanced school, I didn't. I flew those AT nines, so I didn't fly AT sixes that gave you a little practice in that. And I, I, I missed that. I wish I had been able to do that. But um, it's a, it's a tough little airplane. And the big thing is, the big thing that makes it really good is that it had a good engine. The P-38s did not have a good engine. They had Allisons, and they were not reliable, and they had a lot of, they required a ton of maintenance. And these had a Merlin engine, which is a British engine, and it was very reliable and very tough. It was pretty tough. It was really pretty tough for somebody to shoot you down. They they had to really shoot you down. It wasn't that scoop, big scoop, was a little vulnerable, wasn't it? If you got if you got well, yeah, because that's your main coolant uh, scoop, you know. Yeah. And it was yes, it was vulnerable. Yes. And armament, uh, the P fifty one. What did it have for guns? Well, it had six guns. It had three on each wing here, uh -huh. and um, fifty calibers. Yeah. But uh, it was a tough little fighter. But and how about maneuverability? What's it? It was very maneuverable. Compared to the P-38, let's say. Well, it maneuvered in a little different way. You know, you're maneuvering in a right turn and a left turn is different because of the torque, whereas in the P-38 there was no difference. And uh, some of the little finesse things were really different. But it was a marvelous little fighter. It really was a marvelous fighter. And I was a little, I don't want to say chicken, but a little kind of leery of it, because I loved the P-38. But after getting into it, um, I, I really recognized it as, as really a good little fighter, a good airplane. And it was fun to fly. It was fun to fly. And you could dive that one, no problem? Oh, yeah. He, he wasn't going to outdive you, I'll tell you. <laughs> Your only trouble is you might pass it while you're going straight down, which is a little, you don't want to do that. <laughs> and uh, did the P-38 and the P-51, did they have more speed than the ME-109 or the FW? I always felt they did. I don't know whether they really did, and I don't remember the manuals on them, whether they said they were faster or not. Kind of an interesting thing about speed. Well, uh, certainly on the P-51, you could always tangle with them. And I felt that, I don't know whether it was, our pilots were better by that time or not, well, because I think at an early time, most of their good pilots were shot down. I think so. I know one of the guys that I shot down, uh, you know, Dad, he had, you know, 85 kills. And... Um, I think the Germans and Japanese just 
flew their pilots until they got killed, yeah. where we rotated back and trained yeah. and trained with better pilots. But uh, it, it was it was a good little airplane, and, and uh, as, as a matter of fact, I have a picture at our place where we used to, we used to have uh, gunnery training, or not gunnery training, but uh, uh, clay pigeon shooting, and we were one day, and we, we just had a little little uh, post there. I don't think it was 35 feet tall. I don't know what it was for or something. Now one of the guys came down and was he just thought, well, I'll give these guys a little thrill, you know. So he came down and buzzed us, and he forgot about the post. And the post hit him in the wing right here and knocked, it, and knocked about six feet of the wing off. And that was a joke, you know. I mean, it just... Yeah. Cut it, cut that chunk off right, right off there. And uh, he brought the airplane in and landed it. Okay, let's take a pause here. Okay. Okay, we'll pick it up here again. Um, we talked about the. Um, the 51s and the uh, 38s, and uh, so tell me when when did you actually start flying the P38? Then where where was that again? Um, when I first was assigned out of cadet, cadet school, aviation cadet school, uh, I was assigned to Portland, and when I get up to the 55th there, they had literally no airplanes. They had just taken away their P-43s, I think they had, and um, they were converting them to P-38s. So sure enough, finally, you know, a couple of them came in, and then a couple more, and I don't know who flew them in, but some test pilots, I guess, or something from Lockheed. So we had four of them on the field, and um, everybody was very excited, you know, this is a new airplane, and I said, well, what? Nobody could get it to go. Nobody knew anything about the darn things. There was no pilots with experience uh, of the 38s. <clears throat> so they said, well, read that book and really get to know it. Then you got to sit in the, the cockpit for at least 10 hours. Then you're going to get a test. And if you can pass the test, then you can fly it. And. Um, Fortunately for me, when I was at Cal, I was in the little theater company, so memorizing was, you know, a big chunk of the business. To, to be in any play or musical or whatever it was, you had to memorize, you know, what the program was and so forth, and in a reasonable hurry, and know how to relate. So it was easy for me to read the book, and you know, the, this thing is here, and this is on the right side, and this is between your legs, and so forth. And uh, so at the end of four hours, I said, I want to, I want to take the test. They said, well, you know, I don't think you could do that. And I said, well, give me a try. If I can do it, you know, fine. But I don't want to sit there another six hours just trying to make up the time. So anyways, somebody gave me the test, and, and they sat on the wing, and they, they, he has the book. He couldn't even read all the names, you know, of what to do. So it was just, find the what is it, the toggle switch or whatever it was, and then find the, the left gas tank switch over to the right gas tank, so forth. So then he'd look at the book and then he'd look down and see what you did, so forth. Well, I passed that bam like that. And it was only because I had been in these plays. You, you, it's like everything you do, when you, when you do it often, you get used to it, you know. So I got the, I was one of the first ones to fly the, the P-38, and boy, was I excited. Oh, wow, we, that, that, this was terrific. And then, of course, when I came down, everybody, you know, circled around, you know, and asking all these questions about, you know, how is this, what happened, this and that, what's it like with no torque, and so forth, which was very exciting you know, to a degree. But anyway, in the process of all this, the CEO of our base was really kind of a crabby guy. I don't remember his name now. 
But he said, everybody is confined to the base until some, we can start flying these B-38s. And uh, so anyway, you know, here we were locked down for 30 days in Portland, and you could see the townspeople out there. And he thought, oh, boy, would I like to get in town and so forth. So anyway, then they drew straws and um, said, okay, we can have a pass. So I was one of the guys that lucked out and got, this, uh, got to go, go out. And everybody, the same thing as the, the airplane, everybody was standing around, now, don't foul up, don't do something wrong, take it easy and be careful what you say and do and so on. And then the same thing when I came home that night, I had to be home by, I think, 10.30 or something. All the guys are there in the bed when I get there and said, now tell us about what happened out in civilian life. But uh, Portland was re a wonderful town for us. They were, they were really nice and they were really very excited about having us there. And I know everyone uh, really enjoyed it. And then we were moved up to Tacoma. And at that time, all of the, the squadrons were together um, and then finally, the, the uh, well, no, as a matter of fact, we were under the 55th Fighter Group. Then they formed another squadron, which was the 338. And they switched some of us over there as flight leaders and brought in some new people. And then they later on, they s did the same thing again to form the 343rd. So then we had three squadrons and the group headquarters. And uh, that was sort of the rest of our life was spent that, in that system. And uh, I should say now, just because talking about the three units, the three squadrons and the group, that was composed roughly of 25 fighter pilots in each squadron. And then in the group they had probably maybe five or six pilots, and the rest of them were ground personnel. And um, when we went overseas, there was probably 82 of, of us that went over as the 55th fighter group. And when I left there when the, and go, went up to headquarters 8th Air Force, and the war was over, out of that 82 pilots, the losses of the of the uh, 55th Fighter Group was 184 people. So that's, now half of those people were POWs and half of them were killed. That was just about the way the percentage had, had to go. But uh, we were being the, the first long range fighters, it was, it was tough. Now, um, so when did you first go overseas then? Uh, uh, September about 42. And where did you go, and how did you get there? Well, we went <laughs> we went on trains from um, uh, Fort, well, not Fort Lewis, but uh, from uh, Tacoma, which was our base, to um, what is it, New Jersey, and then we boarded the a ship there. And uh, I noticed in uh, some little comments about the formation of the 55th. It said that the ship normally had a passengers of 100 or 1,500 people. And we had, I think, 3,500 enlisted men and the few officers that we had, which was a not, a not a significant number. But there was about 4,000 people on that ship when it's only supposed to have 1,500. And it was tough for the guys, it was tough. And the weather was tough and everybody was sick. It was a, it was a very unpleasant go. Maybe you were kind of wishing, maybe I should have been a B-17. Yeah, right, after yeah. all, I could have rolled yeah. over. And fly over, fly yeah. Over, right. But uh, I remember when we got to, uh, the, the one big thing about, about the boat ride, it was, it's a little bit like they have on the TV now, about the gambling, that these, you know, they have these little gambling units, and then they all play each other, and then the winners go, and then they get, the winners play, and then 
the at the mountain. Finally, they get to the last group, about five guys. But anyway, one of our enlisted men that, that I knew, um, he was in this gang of big gambling. Well, they started out with twenty dollars, I think, and then everybody had, and only one guy had the twenty dollars, and the rest of them were broke. The same thing. The next group, he had maybe two hundred going in, and all of everybody had about that two hundred, and then they eliminated everybody. So he gave me five thousand dollars, which was a lot of money. I'm talking about a lot of money. And uh, he said, "Keep this for me." He said, "You know, I'm afraid with so many people and such a big crowd, I could go to sleep, you know, with that money." But I had a cabin. And so he says, you have a little more security than I do. So he says, save it for me until we get to base, you know. So I, I did, you know, I was really worried about it. But anyway, I was trying to help him out. Sure enough, he got over there, and they wouldn't send the money to, to his home, you know. They wouldn't send it. He said, the most you could send is $100. 5,000 sending it 100 at a time is, is a lot of times. So anyway, sure enough, uh, he finally it took him, I don't know how many months to get rid of all that money, but he finally sent it to his folks, but at $100 a time. But uh, little things that happen that now when I think about them, they're really funny, but sometimes they were, you know, quite serious, you know, at the time. But, so you know, where did you end up over there then? Well, we, we ended up in Glasgow, and I'll have to say uh, one of my most one of my most thrilling experiences up to that time was landing at Moscow, and here we were, you know, very excited about getting there and going to get off the ship and so forth. And by the time they tied it down and everything, here is about. I would say a 20-piece bagpipe band that starts playing. And this, this music, I mean, right even to this day, I almost, tears come to my eyes. It was so exciting and so powerful. And I was ready to strangle every German in Germany, I'll tell you. I was, I mean, I, I was really fired up. I mean, I, and I think everybody was. I, I'm not just the only one. I think everybody just, it was, it was really a, a very thrilling experience. You know, I, God, I couldn't wait to get in an airplane. I wanted to go there and fight somebody. You know? But uh, anyway, that, that was my arrival in Scotland. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. And. Uh, then they, they, they uh, we took a train down to uh, that Hampstead. And that was our first uh, assignment there in England. And later on, they moved us over to a, another place a little closer to the coast called Wormingford. And we finished the war at Wormingford. Now, this is in Scotland or England? No, that was England. Yeah, yeah. England. Okay. Yeah. Old England yeah. So your 55th fighter group and your 338th fighter squadron? Yeah. Well, there's three. There's the 38th fighter squadron, 338th fighter squadron, and the 343rd fighter squadron. But you composed of the yeah. But, but you group. you were you yourself were in the 338th. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody was in 338s. No, in no. You were group. you yourself were in the 338th. Oh, no, no. Squadron. I was in the three. Yes, the 338. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, do you remember your first mission? Well, uh, yes, in a sense it was a mission that was classed as a mission. And uh, or, or I, I guess there's missions and there's sorties or there's... Well, they're the same they're, thing. They're, they're, the, same they're thing. the same thing. Well, and, and were you to... Uh, uh, were uh, you to escort the bombers? Is that what your primary purpose yes, was? Yeah. We were the first, in a sense, the first long-range fighters. I know they they, they used they, to have the the P forty sevens there, and uh, that the early stages they didn't have uh, exterior tanks, and uh, so 
they would only take them in about halfway at the most. And they weren't going here too far in anyway. And then they tried to France, pick right. them up uh, on their way out. But um, we were the first long range ones that went in all the way with the bombers, circled around, came back, back with them. And what was the range that you had? And uh, I don't know the, the range at that time. I really don't. But uh, it meant a lot to the bombers. Oh, yeah. Really meant a lot to them. But, uh, they originally, you know, the bombers thought they could do it by themselves. And they, they had such a loss, it was crazy. And then the fighters came in. And then when our long range came in, and then, of course, we were... We were taking them in farther and farther and farther in Germany as time went by. And uh, in the early days, you know, I used to just pray that I could go fight a German over England, where I could go all out <clears throat> and not worry if my plane fouled up because I could bail out, take a jeep, get back, and tomorrow I could fly in another airplane. It's like and a battle I thought, of Britain. Boy, if I could only fight that way, you know, that's, I'd like to just, just one time be able to do it. But you never do it. But in the latter part of the war, where we finally, you know, I had the upper hand, it was a, it was a, it was a lot better fighting. It really was a lot better fighting. Because you never protected yourself as much as you did in the early days. You had to protect yourself to get back home. Because uh, you had more allied territory to bail yeah. out in. Yeah, and you had more territory. Yeah. So tell me about your first uh, your first mission then. Well, the first mission, <coughs> they had, it was just a indoctrination ride. And what we did, obviously, uh, I'm sure we were, everybody was scared, but um, they took us up there, and here we got every, all these airplanes, and boy, this is a big, this was a big, a lot of, of airplanes, you know. And we got up, I think, to must have been 25,000 feet or something like that. And it, it was a fairly clear day. And uh, so anyway, here we, here's, you know, three squadrons of the 55th Fighter Group coming in over there into, into uh, France and so forth. And I don't know how far we went in, but not very far, not very far. And our leader, at that time, as soon as we hit the ground, I mean, the, the, the interior of France and so forth, he put that nose down a little bit. And I don't know what we were doing, but we, we were doing it mighty fast, mighty fast. And he just went down, went in there ways, <coughs> took a big, big right turn because he had a lot of airplanes, you know, and everybody's undercutting and so forth and switching over. And... Um, so anyway, headed back home, that was it. And when he went out, I, I don't think he was at 12,000 feet. I mean, we were really going. And when I got, over, got home, I thought, you know, that, that was a little exciting. But boy, that Germans must be scared of us. Because we, we must have been doing the fastest mass fly of any fighters in, in the history of the world. <laughs> oh, God. Well, everybody was terribly excited about it. Or we didn't know when we didn't see any airplanes. We saw a little flak, <laughs> but uh, it was it was kind of a, a fun trip, you know. So tell me about the first uh, combat that you. First, what well, what as soon as the, the next the next time we flew, in those days we used to fly um, about every other day. Uh, or every other mission. And you would pick up the bombers at a certain yeah. point? Yeah. Which would be in France or in England? Well, we, we'd pick them up uh, about, well, no, not not right as soon as we got into France. The P-47s would take them oh, in okay. a ways, and we would pick them up, say, the, the last 15 minutes before the bomb run, and bring them out 15 minutes past the bomb run. And then the some, uh, another group of 47s and picked them up as we left. But um, it, it was very tough going in those early days. 
extremely tough. And, um, you know, when you're losing five or six airplanes out of maybe uh, 40 airplanes, that's a big number, you know. It doesn't take too many. Ten days of losing six and 60 airplanes, that's damn near the whole outfit gone. And uh, like uh, in the 338th where I was in, the three other flight leaders, I was a flight leader, the three other flight leaders, he had four flights, they were all, in a sense, equal to me. And uh, we lost all three of those flight leaders. Um, I would say Two of them were killed and one of them was a POW, but we must have lost him in three or four months. Was, was the reason for the heavy losses uh, inexperience or just being outnumbered by the German planes? Or? Yeah, it wasn't a fair fight. <coughs> I used to just wish that I could just run into one guy and, you know, fight him personally. But I don't know how many times I tried to work myself on somebody's tail. And about that time, three other Germans would come from the side or something, and you gotta dodge or else you're, you know, you're duck soup. And uh, in those early days, it was tough. And then, <coughs> and then we used to run into the Abbeville boys once in a while, and they were even tougher. They, they were tough guys, boy. They had what color spinners? They had a yellow. 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 They were the yellow spinners, yeah. And boy, they were they were tough. And I remember, all of a sudden, they disappeared. We thought, oh boy, they're they're doing something. You know, we gotta watch this. They're they're gonna they're laying low somehow, or just gonna box us somehow. And they had sent them down to Africa. And then when we found out that they were some they, the people down there in in Africa said. Geez, there's some tough guys down here with yellow noses, and boy, are they tough. And we said, oh, boy, are they, we're glad are they down there. You know, we don't we have to worry about them anymore. But they were, they, they were good. I, I think the, the lowest guy in the outfit had 75 kills. You know, it was, was there a, a mutual respect for, between you pilots and the German pilots, would you say, or was it just... Did that even enter into it at all? No, I, I think there was equal respect. Well, I'll tell you one example. Um, when we should, when we shot somebody down, you know, that we just shot it down, and the, the game was over. You went in to either fight your way out or fight somebody else or whatever it was, and you never paid much attention to it. But we used to listen to the radio every night. They used to have a gal named Axis Sally that was on the radio. And um, she was always, you know, talking how bad we were and so forth. I mean, this is a bad time. And um, so all of a sudden this day, we noticed that they're shooting the guys down in parachutes. But what the hell is going on with this? This is ridiculous. Right? So they're POWs or they, we don't even know. They, they might die and, and in some cases, we had the farmers kill a guy, you know, and so forth. And he's lost to us. <clears throat> so anyway, we said, the next day, tomorrow, every German we shoot down, we shoot him down in the parachute. And sure enough, I don't know how many we shot down that day, but say we, say it was 15 or so, it doesn't matter. We went out of our way to shoot down the guy in the parachute. Really went out. If we didn't, we scared the hell out of him. I'll tell you that because you, you know, you went by that parachute in a split second and just barely missing it. <clears throat> but anyway, that night, Axel Sally said, "Starts out, the, Ch the Chicago gangsters are now fighter pilots, <laughs> and they shot down, you know, our guys. Absolutely, this is ridiculous." Well, then they realized. They realized we shouldn't do that because when, when they shot us down, we were lost either, POW or dead. 
when their guy, when we shot their guys down, he was back in an airplane the next day. This time, not one guy got in the airplane the next day. He was dead. So anyway, they said we're not doing that anymore. So for, so then we said no, we won't do that either. either. But that was one episode that I remember that mm. that uh, that happened just in two days, one day for them and one day in a sense for us, and then no more. It was just. Was it? But it, it, it was, there was little things like that that, you know, were certainly different. <laughs> this is not what you expect. Yeah. Uh, okay, tell me about uh, your first, uh, the first uh, plane that you got that you shot down, and what do you remember? What mission that was on? Oh no, I don't remember the mission. I I could look it up in my uh, book, you know, but. Um, I, I, I certainly don't remember, but it, I would say in the in the first six weeks I was flying, I shot down four airplanes. One, the first one I shot down one. The second time, I shot two down in that day, and then the, the fourth one, I shot down you know just one individual airplane. And then from there on, my luck was bad was absolutely bad. But also, they learned that they could dive and get rid of us. Yeah. That, that was about that time they learned that if they were high enough, they could dive down and just get rid of us. The four you got, do you remember, were they ME 109s at Fakuos? It was, uh, uh, well, I, I got one of, or two of each. I got, I got a 109, two Fakuos, and then a 109. And and I didn't, didn't. I couldn't tell any difference between the two of them. Was the circumstances similar in each each of the uh, ones you shot down? No, the the, um, the first one. Uh, I spotted him down below me, and I just told the guys, I said, I'm going after that guy down there, and there was I think two or three of them, and. Uh, you know, my, my wingman came down with me, and uh, I picked out the tail end guy of the bunch, you know, and, and got a good shot at him. And um, obviously, he bailed out, so you know, I was, it was a sense that he was he was through. But um, I was going a little bit fast, too fast, really, and. Uh, so I could see I was going to overrun and run in front of them, you know, almost. So I just pulled out, you know, as tight as I could and um, cut out. You know, I thought, well, geez, I, I don't want to get tangled up with these guys right now. I want to get out of there and get set again. And uh, so anyway, I left. But uh, the next day, you know, there was just a dogfight. And in those days, Strangely enough, I think we didn't know that much about it, and they didn't know that much about us. And we got in one tremendous, um, uh, what, I can't think of the name of it, no, but it's, a, it's where everybody is making a big tight turn, it's like a whirlwind, oh. and here's Germans and Americans there, everybody's going around in a circle, and they're stacked up high and here and here and here. And everybody's going around, and you try to take a pot shot at somebody once in a while. And, uh, but there must have been, in that, that fight there, there must have been 60 Germans and 25 of B-38s all flying around crazy, and everybody thought, well, if I can keep it tight enough, nobody can get inside me to, you know, get a shot of me. Then it was a case of, we said, I, I called and I said, okay, uh, on the count of three, everybody head for home. And we all headed for home and, you know, put it in a slight dive and got out of there. But it was, it was, it was kind of a mess. It was really a mess. But it wasn't uh, a, a Hollywood scene uh, type of uh, shootout, you know, it wasn't. It was a, more of a madhouse or a bunch of trucks <laughs> flying around.
So the day that you got your two planes, what were the circumstances of those two? Well, in, in that particular case, uh, I really don't remember it too well, except I just ran into a couple of flights and tangle with, you know, the, you always tangle with the last guy, mostly because you figure he's the beginner, and he sometimes can sneak up on them. And so a couple of the guys, you know, picked off four guys, one, two, three, and four, because whoever's ahead of the other guy, he doesn't look back and watch him, you know, and so he doesn't see that he's shot down, so he doesn't protect himself. And some guy, some guys really hit it perfect that way. Fortunately, or unfortunately, I guess I didn't. But every time I, it, I got somebody, um, it was a wild rat race all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, is it all of them? Did you get on their tail, and is yeah, that's how you? Uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, I have to say, I, I had the feeling that <clears throat> I wanted to, to fly and work hard as a flyer, but, uh, and I did, I really worked hard at it. I really disciplined myself a lot. I thought, if anybody's going to shoot me down, he better be damn good, because I know I'm going to be damn good, and he's just got to be better than I do to do it. You know, he's not going to, I'm not going to give, give the fight away, and I had boxed enough that you know, I was used to that, and sometimes you get whacked a couple of times, and you still can't give up. You got to fight and see so if you can do it. And, and I really worked hard to to be a good pilot. Did you uh, take some battle damage? Your plane get shot up, hey? Not really. I think a couple of times I got a stray bullet, but it wasn't that was might have been shrapnel rather than a bullet. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's got to be important. Of course, you do have a wingman, I suppose, but still, you got to be looking all over the sky, oh, yeah, everywhere, really the, do, all yeah. the time, right? Yeah. You can't let up for an instant, probably. Yeah. No, you have to be. You were, you know, you were exhausted after a four and a half hour flight because you're on edge and you you just can't take it easy. You 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 got to be alert. You got to be more alert than they are. You just have to be. Did you ever get surprised by any any of the enemy fighters? Not not really, not really. I, I really never did. When did you first get your P-51s? Well, I finished a tour before D-Day and uh, was waiting to get shipped back home. And then I see this the trucks come in and they got they got. Tons of paint. I mean, they're full of paint. By the way, I meant to ask you: Were your uh, your P thirty eights were they camouflaged, or were they silver when you were flying? Well, in the latter part, they they, they left them silver. Mm -hmm. They didn't because they, they didn't think the camouflage worked that much for it. You know? And then when we switched to the P fifty ones, then the guys decorated themselves because they were all silver. Yeah, they were all silver. So then they. Made their own. And your P-30, did you fly the same P-38 on all your missions? Yes. Well, no, no. I lost four of them. Uh, somebody borrowed them and got shot down. And, you know, so I, the, the first airplane, I, I named Princess Pat. And then the second airplane, I named Princess Pat too. Why, why did you pick those names? Well, you know, my, my, name, my name Patterson. I thought, well, you know, I meant to ask you too. Had you, uh, did you have a girlfriend or a fiance? I was married. Oh, you're married. married then. You know, oh. I'm married. But anyway, when, when this, I lost the second one, I said, I'm not naming the third one. There's no way I'm going to put a name on that third one. No way I'm going to do it. So one of the ground officers in the squadron said, Chet, how come you're not putting a name on your airplane? <coughs> I said, um, I just don't want to put Princess Pat on it. You know, I lost two of them. I, I think it's unlucky. So, and I said, fortunately, I wasn't in them. And, but it is, it's bad luck somehow. So he says, 
can I name it? I said, sure, you can name it. So he said he got all excited. So he named it Mr. Dunk, which was his son. And his son came and looked me up one time. They lived in back east someplace in New York. And his son came west one time and looked me up and said he just wanted to meet me because his, his father took a picture of him with his sign, you know, the nose of the B-38 there that said Mr. Dunk. <laughs> so he says, I wanted to see the guy who flew the airplane. Yeah. But anyway, uh, let's see, where was well, I? Well, okay, I want to ask you about uh, when did you get married? Uh, <laughs> I got married uh, uh, two weeks before we went overseas. Not necessarily because I knew we were going overseas, but the opposite. I thought that the, the way they worked, we had shipped some guys out, and the, the squadron went to, to uh, Alaska, then another one went to, uh, to uh, Africa, and then we shipped some guys out, so I thought, well, we're going to be here another six months. So I got married. So I got, I got married, and it took, I think I took four days off. And when I come back, and they said, we're going overseas in 10 days. I said, what? I can't believe that. <laughs> and what happened? They said, they shipped in a bunch of new guys, and we're going overseas. We're out of here in 10 days. And I, I wouldn't have gotten married if I had known that. You know, I really wouldn't have. But uh, and anyway. Your, your wife, what was her name? Uh, her Tracy. Name? Tracy. And what was her maiden name? Clifton. Tracy Clifton. And where did you meet her? She was a stewardess, and uh, I used to fly down to uh, Burbank from from uh, Tacoma, and then fly an airplane, a P-38, we'd pick it up out of the factory, fly it back home. And uh, I, I did that several times, that's the way we used to get them back up there. And I used to like that because my family home was, was in San Francisco, so I'd take you off in the afternoon, or not in the afternoon, but take you off about noontime, fly to San Francisco, to Oakland Air, Oakland Air Base, really, and um, park the airplane and then go to see my grandma and uh, relatives there, then fly back uh, the next day. And I used to always fly under the Golden Gate Bridge when I left, you know, because I thought they'd never catch me when I got up by, by the time I got up. <laughs> Tacoma, but it was funny. I always said, "So long, San Francisco. <laughs> See you later." Yeah. I meant to ask you too. Um, was your family religious when you were growing up? Did you go no. to church a lot or anything? No. no, not at all. As a matter of fact, an interesting thing: my father was was not religious. My mother was a Catholic, but not what I call a good Catholic by ones that I've seen in the past. But anyway, I used to, I used to go to, uh, what is it, uh, Presbyterian something. Uh, well, I can't think of the name of it now. That's, that's my age. But uh, anyway, I went I, I went to the Sunday school. My dad had me, made me go every week, you know. <clears throat> and they were talking about Christian Endeavor. That's what they used to call it. And uh, it was for the young kids. And uh, so anyway, this particular day, they were talking about the religion and so forth. And I kind of questioned it because I had read a fair amount. And I said, you know, the American Indians have religion, but it's totally different from ours. The Chinese have Buddhas, which is totally different than ours. And then there's some others, the Eskimos, it's totally different than ours, and totally different from the other ones, too. <clears throat> so I said, hey, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. We can't be the only religion, can't be the only one, it's just not right, because too many other people in other countries, and you can't say that the American Indians were bad, really bad people, because they didn't believe in our religion. And the same thing in Hawaii. You know, the Hawaiians had their own religion until we got over there and followed it all up. 
So anyway, I, I said, you know, something's wrong. We're not totally right and they're not wrong. They might just be just as right as we are. So anyway, <coughs> the uh, fellow that, that was running this session kicked me out. So I showed up home, you know, way early than I would normally show up. My dad says, well, what happened? I said, well, they kicked me out. <coughs> and uh, he said, well, what'd you do? And he thought I did something bad, you know, like, I don't know what, but something bad. <coughs> so anyway, I told him, I said, I, you know, I didn't agree with him on this thing about the, the church of God and so forth, and he threw me out. My dad says, you never have to go back again. Well, that was, that was the end of that, that was the end of my church day. And I've lived that every, ever since then. I've never, never gone to a church. Um, okay, so you were, when you got your 51s, you were uh, up to go home on leave first, did you say? Well, yes. Uh, uh, I, I had finished my tour, and um, I was just waiting for a boat ride to go back to States, but uh, and they would send me from, from the base I was at, uh, at the 55th Fighter Group base. And if they, when they got me transportation, they'd send me down on a train to meet a boat and go home. And I'm waiting there, and here comes these big trucks with a load of white paint and black paint. And I thought, what the heck? What's going on? What's this? And so forth. And uh, so the, the next day, they locked the base down. I mean, locked it. There was a poor farmer there that had a, one of his cows came in our area, and he's trying to drive the cow, cow out. They said, hey, you can't go off, and neither can the cow. They, they got to stay here in the base. Nobody goes off, nobody goes in. <clears throat> so anyway, I knew something, something's up. So I went to headquarters there, and I said, what's going on? They said, well, you know, we're painting the airplanes tomorrow morning, and I think it's a signal that, you know, we're going to go off probably the next day. So sure enough, all of a sudden, we, the airplanes are painted this white and black stripe on either side of the wing and so forth. And I said, well, I'll, if it's if they're going to have D-Day the next day or something, I want to fly. He said, no, you can't do it. You finish your tour. And I said, I can't believe I can't do it. You know, I, I want to fly. And I said, that's what I was fighting for this whole time. You know, I want to get in on it. And so forth. Well, they said, well, we, we can't let you fly because you're supposed to be grounded. So anyway, they flew around and sent to headquarters in the, command, the fighter command and then the headquarters 8th Air Force. Doolittle says, if he wants to fly and he's that eager, the hell with him, let him fly. So anyway, they did it. I mean, fine. 20 hours, because I figured I'll fly four or five hours of flight. Fly every other day. That means I'll be here roughly 10 days. And that's, I can stand that. That's that's okay. So anyway, now the next day they said, hey, the D-Day is now. So we get up, I don't know, it was 2.30 in the morning or something. And get briefed and so forth. And here's the deal and so forth. <coughs> and get in the airplanes. I mean, we took off really when it was dark, still dark. 38s or 51s? 38s. 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 Okay. And boy, I'm out there and she's as eager as hell and I don't know what's going to happen, you know. We figure it's going to be a big fight. So we get over there and we're cruising around about, it seems to me, about 12,000 feet. And I'm watching this whole thing. I mean, it is unbelievable what is down there. These boats, I, I mean, it looked like a little kid's uh, bathtub with all of his toys in there. And uh, it was an unbelievable sight, you know. A lot of uh, smoke from gunfire, you know. And uh, there was a lot of action. And our, the P-38s had the best job of everybody. They said, if it's a P-38, don't shoot it. If it's anything other than a P-38, shoot it. So they never put any B-7 or B-47s in there or P-51s. Any, 
all the Manning area, Omaha and all that stuff was patrolled by P-38s. <coughs> so the, the, we knew that and they were told us that, that if there's anything that's a single in the airplane, shoot it down. Don't even discuss it. Shoot it down. So anyway, nothing happened. So I think at the end of three and a half, four hours, I flew back to the base. I said, gas me up and give me a sandwich, you know. So anyway, that day I threw nine, nine and a half hours, and the next day I threw ten and a half hours, so I finished my 20-hour tour in two days. <laughs> but uh, in a sense, I really had a bird's-eye view of, of the invasion, because it was a nice altitude, you know, and yeah. we threw everything, and there was no Germans in the area. I mean, they didn't even come close to it. They, I don't know why, whether they chickened out or were fooled or for whatever reason, I don't know. But there was no Germans at all. So then we started, uh, I, didn't, I didn't fly anymore, but then the next day we started strafing. The guys started strafing and stuff. Because they were, you know, wanted to do something, help those ground guys. But at least they weren't bothered by any German planes. So then, did you did you get did you come home? I came home for kind of a thirty day speaking tour. They had arranged for me to to uh, speak, and uh, which I did. I went to uh, oh gosh, about four air bases. What would you talk about? To, and just tell them, you know, what was going on in, in combat and what actions you have to do. And um, after the first talk, I thought, hey, uh, I got something going. Uh, wait, till the, wait till I go to the next talk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outfox these guys. Because a lot of the guys come up to me after and ask questions, individual questions. <clears throat> and always about, it seemed to me it was, five or six guys, at least seven guys, said, Jesus, I really want to, I'd really like to go up there and fight. I went, boy, I really want to get in there. <clears throat> so the next time I went to give a talk, I brought a little pad with me, you know, those little small notepad things put in the pocket. So anyway, now I finished the talk, and sure enough, here comes that guy, that, that, Jesus, I really like to, I said, I tell you what, <clears throat> give me your name and your serial number. I said, we'll have you over there in, within a week or so. <laughs> so I wrote on, boy, oh, they, 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 you could almost see them turn red and say, well, geez, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but of course, I, I didn't have it, but I thought, I, I got to have some fun out of it. I'm going to at least scare a couple of guys. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, it was, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I can't score for that. But so anyway, I, I only... Uh, was over here for 30, 30 days and went back right into combat. And then we switched the P-51s. <clears throat> and I was reading something the other day, I don't know what it was, but it said that everybody flew at least 10 hours in the 51 before they went into combat, you know, in the group, because mm -hmm. that was what they had to do to get familiar with it. And I flew uh, just two and a half hours and thought, you know, I'm ready to go. So I said, hey, so the transition wasn't too difficult. No, it really was. It was. It was a, it's a good little airplane, very alert and, and eager to do. It's it's eager to play. Yeah. You know, it's like a like a good uh, puppy dog or something. It, it wants to go. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, geez, you know, I feel confident enough. And I did some acrobatics and you know tested what what it would do and what I could do with it. I really never, I, I, I wasn't worried, I wasn't worried. Did you get in any fights? Uh, no, that? well, I got in a couple of fights, but not enough to uh, to get involved in. And uh, then, oh, I, I guess I flew probably about 35 combat hours and 51s, which is about a tweak over a half a tour. And then I got called up to headquarters and worked for General Dulu personally. Okay, I want to talk about that, but you had also mentioned that you had met a flying tiger that you became friends oh, with. Oh, yeah. Was that? I just mentioned it to the fellow there, <coughs> a guy named Chuck Sawyer. 
was sent to our squadron here in the States, or the group here in the States. And somehow he and I hit it off very well. And uh, so anyway, we used to go out and have dinner together and so forth. And he had got some car someplace and had, had driven up to, uh, to uh, Tacoma from Los Angeles, I think it was. <clears throat> so anyway, we were talking one night, and he says, you know, he says, he says Chad, we got to go to the jewelers tomorrow. I have some uh, stones that I picked up over there in China or someplace, and uh, I want to see what they're worth. So I said, sure, I'll go with you. So we go into t down to Tacoma and find a jeweler, and he goes in the back of the truck of the car under the under the wheel of the spare wheel, <coughs> and uh, here's this little leather bag, a little tie on it, you know. <coughs> he said, uh, goes in there and shows the guy these these jewels. I didn't know what they were. They didn't, you know, they looked okay to me, but I didn't know. And gee, this jeweler said, oh, oh, I can't believe this, I can't believe it. He said, these are cat's eyes, these are cat's eyes. Well, well I, you know, I was a little excited. But uh, apparently it's a, kind of a rare jewel, and uh, these are pretty, they were pretty big. They were as big as my, my thumbnail, you know, and around like a, like a, a wall, like a, a, a you know. A, Marble? A, yeah. And so... <coughs> Anyway, the guy says, I can't handle these. You know, he says, that, 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 that's too much for me. I, that's too much. I can't do that. But he says, that, that's really valuable. So anyway, he, he never put him back under the tire <laughs> after that. I don't know what he did with him. He only stayed with us for oh, a month and a half or yeah. so. <clears throat> so how, um, how is it that you got sent to uh, headquarters then, uh, 8th Air Force? Well, our original, uh, the original CEO I had at the 55 group was, um, okay, I now I can't even think of his name now, but uh, I always got along with him very well. And as I say, I used to do a lot of demonstrating of the P-38 and uh, uh, I can't think of his name now, darn it, I'm getting old. but. Anyway, he was up at headquarters, 8th Air Force. He had been taken away from us almost right after we got there. <coughs> so anyway, uh, when General Doolittle said he wanted a fighter pilot, he recommended me. And uh, so anyway, I went up there and uh, it was the best job in the entire 8th Air Force. <coughs> General Doolittle and I hit it off. He was a tough guy. I mean, he was tough. And he expected you to, expected a lot out of you. And if you didn't put it out, boy, he fired the guys right now. And I think the, the guy's job that I took, he had fired them. And uh, so the first couple of jobs, uh, I thought, you know, if he's tough, I want to I pay attention. I want to really do, do this job right do it ahead of time, you know, no matter what it was. So anyway, he gave me a couple of jobs, and I did them, I thought I did them very well, and he said, okay. So about the third time, he says, here's a problem, I want you to go solve it, and then just let me know how you're, how you're doing. Well, pretty soon we're, 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 we're doing pretty well, and we're we now know we're going to overrun some POW camps. So we're in a big conference room and there's, you know, the British representative and the French representative and, and several higher ups than I was, General Dulu, a couple of other guys. And I said, General, I said, you know, we're about to overrun a couple of those POW camps. I mean, the, the tanks are. And I said, those tank people, they, they don't want anything to do with us, I, mean, I don't think. They're fighting, they're fighting. And I said, there are our guys, because all of, most of them were ours. I said, I think maybe that's our responsibility. He turned around and he says, you take care of it. 
tell me what you're going to do. So I said, oh, Jesus, i got to do something, you know. So, boy, I worked like, you know, and then, how am I going to do it? How am I, you know, i, I got to get those guys out of there as fast as I can. i got to get some safe place for them. So anyway, we ended up, we took one of the bomb squadrons, and we took out all the bomb racks, all that equipment, put in plywood floors over there, and we were just going to jam the guys in the airplane, because we knew we could take off with as many as they could handle, guys, and fly them out. Now we got to send them to what we call, we ended up calling the Lucky Strike Camp, mm -hmm. which is at La Harbe. Put in a field, the whole thing, put up tents, bring a bunch of doctors over there, and so forth. And we brought out, I think they finally said it was 42,000 guys, literally in usually maybe no more than two or three days after our armament overcame the POW camp. And uh, it was a good thing. And, and I say, if you notice my awards there, I, I got a French Croix de Guerre and, and a, a Belgian Legion of, Medal, of Merit. And that was for both of those, because there were a few Frenchmen that we brought back and uh, uh, myself and General Doolittle and uh, the operations officer, I think, all got that award. And um, then later on, I had another job. He said, uh, you know, we're going sh to ship the, uh, some of the people over to the continent, and they're going to have the continent. So he said, I want an outline of what we're going to do. So I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make myself the best job in the whole world, in the Air Force. So I said, here's what we do. So I read it, write this whole thing down. General Doodle looks at it, reads it over, reads it again. He says, that's what we're going to do. That's it. So he says, I'm but he says, you got to you got to fly and cover some of those places where we put the airplanes because we, you know we don't know whether the, air, the airplane or the, the, they bombed the, the buildings or they did this or that or the other thing and uh, so we got to be sure we send the guys to a, some place that's workable. Well, so now I got I get a B-38 airplane and I fly way up north. I fly from there all the way down through France and so forth, Spain. Germany down to Casablanca and check all the airports and so forth. Well, I got one little story that I always used to tell. I go to this one airport and the runway is perfect. I go in and land there, no problems at all. And I thought, boy, oh boy, this is great because most of them, you know, I had a heck of a time landing. Sometimes I had to land in the dirt off the side because they, they bombed up the, bombed the runway. <coughs> So I thought, this is going to be really nice. They probably didn't do a damn thing to it. I don't see any per trouble at all. So I get out and I get a Jeep, and you know, they always had a rider for me or a driver, drive through the thing. <laughs> and every place, every John on this field was blown up with a hand grenade. <laughs> this, this, this German, whoever was supposed to close the field as they, you know, Moved back, <laughs> he threw a, a hand grenade in every John, and every John was blown up. Everything was the damnedest thing. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> but surprising enough, that was worse. That was almost worse than uh, bombing them the airfield, because at least we could bring in some heavy equipment and cover it up in you know an hour. You, you know, the bomb wouldn't take that. It was just a big rut. None of it would work over, you know, and go back and forth and it would be fixed in a, well, a couple hours anyway. But you couldn't get toilets, I'll tell you, in the base. And you wouldn't get them for six months at the, at the best. <laughs> and this guy, I got a kick out when I came back and I wrote up the report and I said, one of the guys was a, a smart guy. He said he really wrecked that base for sure. <laughs>
But anyway, it was a wonderful experience for me. You know, as a, I, you know, I was only 24 at that time, and uh, I was a lieutenant colonel at the time. But what an experience! So you saw uh, Doolittle quite often then. Well, I saw him every day. I tell you what, the the area is as big as what we have up here stairs here, yeah. and just what you and I were walking through, and. Uh, there was Doc, uh, General Doolittle and his secretary, Mary, um, and she had a separate office. And then there was two s smaller offices about the size of this, and myself and uh, Colonel Pierce. And he was called uh, the Director of Plans and Requirements, and my title was Assistant Director of Plans and Requirements. And that was for... Uh, that was the, his job was to was in theory for everything that is ahead of us, not now, nothing now, but something that we ha we should do or should solve in a couple of weeks, a month, two months, four months, and that's the way. So we spent all our time that way. And that's why I got involved in in removing these prisoners of war. And, and, and you know, putting our both bombers and fighters in Europe when the war was over. And uh, well, there was a couple of other jobs I can't think of them right now at the moment. But um, they were all future things, and it was really great. It was really interesting. I loved it. I really enjoyed it. Okay, let's uh, take. So how many of you work in uh, Doolittle's office then? Well, uh, the, the way they had been set up, there was this little ramshackle building, very small, that was sitting on this sleep, uh, this hill, a side hill supply. And where uh, where was the base, or was it in London? High Wycombe, High Wycombe, oh. England. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the headquarters of the 8th Air Force. And down below this, there was a girls' school, and they had kicked all the girls out. And now the, everybody that were officers lived there. And then there was another area for enlisted men. And I, they must have had, uh, oh, they must have had 40 or more in the headquarters at the Air Force. And it was all underground. It was, Totally dug out and wonderful offices down there with a lot of communication equipment, you know, it really was uh, for a big operation. But if you looked at it, you, it wouldn't look like anything. And General Lulu and his secretary and Colonel Pierce and myself, we were in this little small unobtrusive building on the outside. <coughs> and. Um, Whenever he said, well, we're going to have a staff meeting, Mary, his secretary, would come in and say, you know, the general's going to go downstairs in 20 minutes, so be ready. So we'd go down, and I have some pictures of our of the uh, room. And uh, it was a room about bigger than, about the same size, maybe bigger than the, the one that, that's over there past the wall. And... Uh, it had all the maps on it and all the stuff, and then it had, uh, normally had, <coughs> I would say, uh, probably 12 men that were there for any briefing, anything that we're going to do, you know, right now. <coughs> and uh, talked about problems or whatever it was. And uh, General Doolittle would go down there, and then they'd make the presentation and you know, what what they're doing, what the what uh, the fighters were going to do, and where they're going to bomb, and this and that and the other thing. And he'd ask questions, or then say, "Well, I think we should, you know, work that over for a couple more days or something." <clears throat> but it was it was uh, it was really terrific. So anyway, about. 
10 or 12 years ago, I went over there with another general friend of mine, and we spent 30 days over there going through England and France and so forth. And uh, so I went up to High Wycombe, and because I wanted to see this, and I told my wife, I said, you know, we're way underground, and I said, well, maybe they're still down there, and I'll take you down there and show you it to you, and so I'll show you the building and outside. We get there, can't see anything, nothing other than the building that was there, they knocked down, and they had covered over that whole thing. You couldn't even tell, I couldn't even tell where the entrance was. And um, they had totally demolished it. And my, my wife always looked at me and said, say, well, you know, you're making up stories. I'm not too sure I can believe you anymore. Because I said, oh, it was underground, it was right there. But uh, it was really uh, an exciting thing for me. And one of the pictures that I have is a, a day with it. It was General Doolittle and General Allard. And I can't think of some of the other names, Ramsey and Underwood and so forth. And uh, I'm in the background. I always stood up in the background because I was a junior officer. I was a lieutenant colonel, but I was still a junior officer. And uh, it was the, the time that uh, the, the, where we had that big battle where the Germans uh, came back and captured about, uh, or an army or something. Battle of the Bulge? Uh, the battle of the Bulge, yeah. And um, this was the briefing taken right at the time of the briefing when we said, we, we're gonna, we can't have to cancel, we, we can't go up that day because the weather was so bad on the ground, we wouldn't know where the hell we were dropping the bombs or have no checkpoints or anything like that, so just can't do it because you love a bomb our own guys. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, it was a, it's a very intense photograph because when you look at everybody is really concentrating and really worried and you know, we always, we wanted to be there. We wanted to help our ground forces out and uh, do the best we could, which we know we could we could handle it if we could get there, but there was no chance we'd get there. And going back to that particular thing, I remember there was a uh, general, and I see here I can't remember the name, but anyway, General Patton and he were, he were, you know, running just about together. And uh, so anyway, he was a tough old um, army general. And he says, I need some help. And we, of course, we were told all the generals, you know, if you want some help, holler and we'll, we'll send some stuff over there to, to help you out. And uh, he says, I need some help. I want you to bomb right here. And GZ has it on a map. and. Uh, we're going to be right here. Well, he's right there. He's 200 yards from the line he drove. And we said, well, no, you got to go back, you know, at least 2,000 yards, maybe a little more than that, or at least 2,000 yards. And he says, I'm not giving up one inch that we've, we've fought for this, and I'm not giving up one inch, and I know, I heard that you, you guys could bomb in on a dime. You got to do it. Let me see if you can do it. We said we can't do it. We can't. You got to move back. He says I'm not giving up the land. So he says, well, okay. If you really want us to do it, we'll do it. But be wary. And we killed him. And boy, from there on, like Patton, and the next time he asked, said move back two thousand yards. He says, is that all you want? <laughs> <laughs> but it was in the. Uh, you know, it was a terrible tragedy, but he was an old, stubborn soldier, and boy, when he fought for ground, he was not going to give anyone up, but it was too expensive, you know, at that rate. But uh, it was one of the things that happened, but strangely enough, <clears throat> I think it relieved some of the thoughts of a lot of the other generals that you know, when they say to move back 2,000 yards, fine, cooperate, move back, because they'll, they'll go in and they'll help you, and you can move faster with their help than you can by yourself by a long shot. Yeah. 
but uh, there was lots of things like that that are were so unique. Uh, well, as a, as a matter of fact, when the war was over, I was on a committee. Well, no, no, I guess maybe it wasn't over, but it, we had we had gone past a lot of places, and this was um, Stuttgart in Germany, and. Uh, so I went over there, this was one of my assignments, was to go with a group of guys, British generals and uh, a Russian general, a French general, and a couple of other guys, and myself. And I'm uh, this lowly <laughs> lieutenant colonel, you know. So we go over there and they're all ground officers. And I'm the only one with a set of wings on it. And uh, so we go over there to analyze, you know, what the, the devastation that the bombing did. And then also what the tanks did and so forth. So we're in Stuttgart, I think it was. And um, boy, it was really pounded. I mean, really pounded. You could hardly get down the middle of the street because when the buildings fell and all these bricks, they used a lot of brick. It would just kind of crumble, you know, and be piled up on the edge and then go to a little thin edge down at the bottom. You could just work the cheaps through the, and uh, so anyway, we're, every, you're impressed by all this devastation. And uh, the guy says, by the way, he says, Patterson, what were you? And I said, I was a fighter pilot. You know, you couldn't tell the difference between bomber and fighter. I was a fighter pilot. And I thought to myself, I, I see if these guys got a sense of humor. And I said, you know, this is a this is a good example of the firepower of fighters. I mean, look at this, look at this town. <laughs> well, I thought it was kind of funny, and they didn't think it was funny at all because they were all ground officers, you know. And uh, <laughs> I thought, geez, I think I, I can't do it. Th those are not jokes to them at all. It didn't work. <laughs> But uh, again, it was just a wild experience for a young guy. Just really wild. How long were you on uh, Doolittle staff then? Or was I would say I was would say about uh, eight months. And um, when he pulled out, I, I don't remember now whether it was a couple of days before the war was over or. Just after the war was over, like talking about the war in Europe, and he, well, he you know he was going to go to Japan, and we were going to go there and follow him up, you know. Yeah. And um, so anyway. Um, so this is before when his, when his assignment came up, uh, he couldn't take his secretary with him. They wouldn't let her go because it was too. At that time, it was. Too much in the war, yeah. and uh, so anyway, uh, he said, "Well, I'd like to wait till you know my secretary can get over there, and uh, because she really takes care of me and gets some messages out that's important to me." And so, so anyway, he uh, laid off for a while, and in the meantime, they hit him with the atomic bomb, and it was over, you know. But otherwise, I expected to end up in Japan with him. So you were, uh, so even after VE Day, you were still over in Europe? Right? Yes, yeah. At High Wycombe the whole time? No, uh, yes, that's at High Wycombe, yeah, yeah. That was at the end when I was there, yeah. Okay. And so what were your duties then after VE Day? Well, uh, after the war, I had decided I wanted to get out, and this Colonel, uh, this uh, colonel that was my boss wanted me to stay in. And I said, no, I want to get out. I mean, I'm going to get out. And of course, I had more than enough points. I mean, I had, I had enough for two returns. And uh, so anyway, I said I wanted out. And so they, uh, they sent me uh, back to the States. And I went from New York to uh, Santa, Santa Ana and got out in a month. Okay, but after the war in Europe was over, you stayed in on Doolittle's staff. Just, just, uh, just uh, 
uh, just a very short time. Oh, just a short time. A very short time. Okay. You know, only a matter of a two or three weeks. Oh, I see. Okay. So, so when you got out, uh, okay. So then you came back. You got. Uh, what did you do after you got out of the service? Uh, well, when I got out of the service, I had an uncle that was in the advertising business in San Francisco, <coughs> and uh, so he said, uh, "Why don't you come and work for me?" I said, well, was he, you know, when I was studying to be a mech engineer at Cal. And uh, he says, no, you, you, I think you'd like it. He says, why don't you come over and try it? So I said, well, i got to go to school first because I didn't have, I've never had any schooling in advertising. So I went to a specialty school in Los Angeles, uh, Art Center School called. And uh, I stayed there for six months and went to school at night in the daytime and the nighttime, because I wanted to do it in a hurry. <clears throat> so anyway, I, I really kind of found I, I liked it. So then I got up there to uh, San Francisco, started to work for him, and fell in love with it. I really fell in love with it, just like flying. I really, maybe that's the kind of guy I am, that uh, if there's something there that tweaks my inches, uh, I really get interested in it. But anyway, I've, uh, I really enjoyed the advertising. And uh, so my uncle quit in a month, and I took his partnership. And uh, he had a, he, he had always had a partner. And I took over his partnership. And then uh, at that time, I guess, I ran the thing. The uh, partner was an artist, and he was a working artist, you know. So he was working really on the table, and I was working on the business part of it. And uh, so it lasted for, oh, I don't know, about 10 years or so. <coughs> and the advertising agencies, uh, inflation started a little bit. And uh, so the big agencies who were our customers, BBDO, Young and Rubicum, Ken Erickson, and so forth. The big agencies couldn't take an account that was less than 200000 And uh, <clears throat> so I thought, geez, you know, 200000 I can make money on 200000 So I, I thought, geez, I, I got to figure out something on this thing. So anyway, I figured out a plan. So I go to the, the president of BBDO and Ken Erickson, G. Walter Thomas, and I said, oh, look, you guys have those guys out looking for work, and you run into somebody, and I said, maybe they only have 100000 120000 to spend in advertising, and you have to turn them down. And I said, I'll make you a deal. You tell me who they are, and I'll go and solicit their work, and I can, and I can handle them. And then if they grow, I'll give them back to you. I said, you're kidding. I said, no, that's a, that's a deal I'll make. If they grow, you get them back. And the way it is now, you lose them. You know, it's gone forever. I give them back to you. I said, Jesus, yeah, hell, I'll do that. It's a good deal. So now I have all these big agencies with their employees looking for, you know, to help me out because they know they're going to get it back. And so I changed my business from a, an advertising art service to an advertising agency. And uh, all of a sudden it just blossomed. It really worked good and was great and uh, I have to say kind of a, a small version of an American success. And uh, it was really good for me and I had a lot of fun. And, some of the agencies, when I tried to give them back, they wouldn't go back. They said, no, no, we, we like it with you. So I said, well, geez, i got to explain this to these guys. You know, you're, you're bigger now because uh, they do, in, in, in certain agency sizes, they'll list, you know, how much they spend. And I thought, well, I don't want the guys to say I didn't give them back. So I always went and told them that, you know, they don't want to go back. But, I explained to him what the deal was. So anyway, it really worked good for me. The only problem I had at that time 
is our office was in San Francisco. So um, the commute started getting worse and worse and worse. It really did. And uh, so I finally said, no, nope, I'm going to close it down. And I'm going to move my office over to Marin County. So I bought a building in Marin County. And um, were you living in Marin County? Oh, yeah, I was living in Marin County. Yeah. Where, where in Marin County? In Green Bay. Let's see, I know where Mill Valley is. Well, uh, Mill Valley and Green Bay is the next town okay. before you get to San Rafael. Okay. So anyway, uh, I thought, geez, i got to get rid of this thing. So I bought a building over there and uh, put, my, put my office in there. And uh, it really worked. My, I was only three and a half minutes from my house to the office. And not in any traffic to speak of at all. And uh, I had wonderful people to work for me. And Friday when I retired, I told the kids, I said, uh, I mean, when I say kids, they were the young people who were working for me. I said, I will give you the business as long as you run it and take care of it and so forth. So of course they jumped at that, but they didn't have any money. So then I put the money up for all of them. And it ended up a good deal for them and me and, and so forth. They paid me off in about, oh, I guess about five or six years. And it's still going, but they changed the name. It used to be Patterson and Hall. Now it's p and Design. But uh, it's kind of one of those uh, live happy ever after yeah. deals. And they're very successful, and uh, it was a wonderful deal for me, and I really enjoyed it. I really had fun. So what year did you uh, retire then? I retired about 10 years ago, 94. And uh, do you have any children? I had two, two children. One, one died. My other boy still lives in Marin County, and uh, I have a grandson. Uh, what's your son's name? My, my son's name is Randy. I have to say I had two boys. <clears throat> my father was a, an Army officer. I was an Air Force pilot. My oldest son joined the Navy during Korea, and he was in the Navy. My other son in Vietnam was a Marine. So wow. we, everybody yeah, was, all of them. Everybody's got hit, hit one of the services, but the son that's still alive, he uh, he uh, is really a really good boy. And I say boy, guys, he's, he's 54 years old, you know. But I can't help but call him a boy. What does he do? Uh, he's a contractor. Yeah. But uh, I have to say, I, I really lived a golden life. And your wife is, is still alive? She's still alive, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you've been and married. And guess, guess what? i got to tell a joke about that. Her father, she was born in Guam. Her father was a Navy officer. Had gone to the Annapolis in 1921 and uh, stayed in the Navy all the time. And um, so anyway, he was old and fairly old and reasonably crippled and was in a restaurant when she and I got married. She's my second wife. My first wife died. And uh, so anyway, so she wanted me to meet her, her father. She didn't say anything to me and I never used my, my army and my military rank. So uh, she said, uh, Dad, I'd like you to meet Colonel Shep Patterson. Colonel, this is Admiral Lewis. I said, how do you do, sir? He says, the Army? I said, no, sir. He says, the, the Marines? I said, no, sir. He says, the goddamn Air Force? <laughs> I really got a kick out of that. He was a, an old, diehard Navy guy, and he did not like the Air Force at all. So I said, that was my introduction to my father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what, what was your wife's maiden, your second wife's maiden name? Her name was Lewis. His, he was Admiral Lewis. And her first name? Uh, 
uh, Roberta. Roberta. And how long have you guys been married now? Well, we've been married 22 years now. My wife died when I was fairly young. I was 44, 44 when she died. And um, you're telling me you've been living here in the desert for about 10 years or so? <clears throat> yeah. Full time or part time or what? Well, we have a home in Pebble Beach, and uh, we're, I, I, I play, I've played a lot of golf in my life, a lot of golf, and uh, I was good enough at it that uh, I joined Spyglass years ago when they first opened, and uh, so we had, I, I played in Spyglass tournaments a lot, and. Uh, so we bought a home up there in the hill, kind of a little place up there. Did you happen to know uh, Ed Driscoll? Uh, I think he was a member of Spyglass, and they had Driscoll's strawberries and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And we were friends. So we're well, you know, Spyglass is a very unique place. I'm talking about very unique. The most unique golf club in all of the United States, is, in my opinion. Of course, I pull up there. But here, if you if you know golf at all, which I, I spent a lot of time with golf, played all over the world, did a lot of things. But uh, Spyglass Golf Tournament, there's only 254 of us that belong there. It's a man's club, and it's it's a legal man's club. When I die. Word is out. They give her a check, and that she's out. She can't come back. The deal that we have at Spyglass, which were contracts we made with the Pebble Beach Corporation years ago, 1964, actually, and uh, we abide by that contract, boy, by the letter, because we don't want to change one word in it. Because if you change one, you got to change four, seven, eight paragraphs, and so forth. But anyway, if you know golf at all, a lot of golf now costs you a fair amount of money. Pebble Beach now costs you $250 per round. Spyglass, which is a better golf course than Pebble Beach, I think the charge at the Pebble Beach Corporation to play Spyglass is is two hundred dollars, but to play with me as my guest, it only costs you fifteen dollars to play with me, because that's in our original contract. That was what it was at that time, and we don't want to change a word in it. And so, but anyway, uh, I've been a member there, and I was on the board of directors for. They have a different deal there, and so you're not on the board like normal boards. You're usually on for either a two-year or three-year stretch. Spyglass, if you're on the board, you're there until you die or don't want to do it anymore. So I was on there for 22 years, I think. And uh, it was a lot of fun and I enjoyed it. But uh, after the war, when I came home, my dad, as I said, was a coach. And he never played uh, golf at all. And uh, so he says, what are you going to do after the war for athletics? I said, I think I'm going to play golf. You see those old guys with knickers? And they look like they're having a lot of fun and uh, so forth. And that's something you can play all your life. You know, basketball you can't play very long. Tennis, I played quite a bit of tennis. But at that time, you didn't even play tennis very late. So I said, I think I have to play golf. And he says, that's a sissy sport. He says, that's not a contact sport. Why do you want to play that, you know? And I said, well, I, you know, you can play that. Well, I started playing golf, and just like flying, I worked hard at it and enjoyed it. I, when I work hard at things, I, I don't, it's not that, it, that I'm working hard, I really enjoy it. So anyway, I got good enough to be the club champion twice, and uh, once the state amateur champion from the Florida Seven handicap at Pebble Beach, and uh, played golf, and I had I took my own tour with 24 people, and uh, played different courses. Go to Scotland. Well, 
uh, on the trip to Scotland, I took the trip to Scotland, <coughs> and uh, in a sense I didn't like it a little bit because we were playing a different course each day. And I thought, geez, I could have played that course a lot better if I knew that the water was there, the sand trap was there, things you didn't see, you know. You got up there and it was in the trap or in the water or whatever it is. And I thought, I don't see why they don't have a trip where you play two days on each course. And when I came back, I had gone over with Mike Rizzuto, who was our tour leader. And I said, Mike, why the hell? Why don't we do this way? And he said, well, I don't know. Everybody seems to like this. So I said, I'm going to have my own tour then. We're going to go and play each course two days. Then we have a travel day and go to another course. So we went to Sawgrass, Hilton Head, Pinehurst. I don't know if we had two more courses. Homestead, I guess it was. And. Um, Took, I took 12 couples with me, and uh, it really worked out good. Everybody had a fantastic time. So everybody said, Chad, where are we going next year? You know, and I said, that's it. I'm not doing it next year. It's over. I did it once. I'm through. But I'm really sorry I didn't, didn't do it more because it really was a fun trip. And people still talking about it, you know, 15 years later. But uh, golf has been good to me. And of course, I live, you know, we live on a golf course here. At the lakes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and you're still, you'll, you'll still play? No. Nope. You, you, you'll, you know, you do you still play golf? No. Nope. Oh, yeah. It's, it's over. That's why we're moving back to Marin County. We're closing up the house here. And, yeah. and uh, I, I really, uh, I found that I wasn't enjoying it, you know. It would, Golf was always a thrill, a lot of fun, and I loved the people I played with and enjoyed. And every day when I played, whether I played good or bad, didn't make any difference. If I played bad, I looked forward to tomorrow when I could play better and whatever it is. And it was, I started feeling, you know, that Jesus, this is work, and I'm tired, and I didn't have much fun, and so forth. And finally, I said, hey, I hang it up, you know, which you, I did. Do you have other interests? Are you busy? Yeah, I spend a lot of time on the uh, computer and this thing here. This thing here that you see, I, I do this for the 55th Fire Group. And um, so this, is a, newsletter? this is a guy I, I kind of discovered. <coughs> When uh, the war was over, I, I told the guys, I said, uh, I'll make a um, newsletter for our, our group. And uh, so anyway, I made up uh, a newsletter somewhat similar to this without color, a lot of black and white. So anyway, I get a, this letter from a guy, and he says, you don't know me, Colonel Patterson, but he says, I'm Sergeant Sam, and my, my father was a doctor. <coughs> And we used to take color pictures. He'd have a lot of film left over of an emergency thing. <clears throat> so he'd always send me what's there, uh, left over film. So he says, I have a lot of color pictures of World War II. I said, you got to be kidding. There's none. Of, nobody has any color pictures. He says, I got them. So I said, well, send them to me. So he sends them to me. And... Um, they were unbelievable. He's a natural photographer, and I'm talking about, you know, those are, those are, those are beautiful they pictures. Are. I mean, they're just tremendous pictures. They're not just little hack pictures of my life. So anyway, after I saw him, well, I, you know, again, I was in the ad business. So I said, hell, you got to do something with these. <clears throat> he said, well, I don't know. I, 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 I said, I'm going to do something. <clears throat> so anyway, he has three books now out where some writers, I got them together with a couple of writers, and they said, I can't believe that he's got these color pictures. We never had those ideas so far. And got them together with the writer, and they wrote up some books and used some of his photographs. So he was out signing these books, things, you know, like the writers do, 
but he was the photographer and they featured his photographs. But anyway, uh, he's really a wonderful guy. Yeah. So you pub you publish the uh, newsletter yourself? Yeah. So off the computer, basically? Yeah. What kind of program do you use? I uh, I think I don't know what it's name, but I think it's I just I just use the Microsoft system. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, it works very well. And of course, I bring it to the printer. And. Uh, Tell them, you know, these are the photographs I want here, and they sure. You can look at that, that inside cover, center cover, too. There's, Those are the black and white photographs. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. That's just great. I think that's your flying tiger guy there. Yeah. Does it cost a lot to your front and back pages your, to print your color pages? Well, I have it down now to a system now. And uh, we're producing that book that you see right there. We're producing 300 of them for uh, uh, $180. And that's cheap. 16, 20 pages. Sometimes 16, sometimes 20. Yeah. And uh, wow. that includes the mailing. Huh. And that's, I have to t say, and I don't mean it the way it sounds, but that's because of my experience in advertising. You know, I know how to, sure. yeah. to uh, get that to work. I wish you weren't moving away. Uh, you could maybe give them some tips on our news. We have a newsletter here that the well, Air Museum has, you know. That, uh, they talk that they it's, have done nothing in color because they're concerned about the cost of you know, any color. Well, the cost a few years ago, not too many years ago. I never did it in color. Let me, let me see. Uh, here, this is, uh, this is the way I used to do it. It was the black and white like this. See? Yeah. No color at all. Uh -huh. no, no, none at all. But when I found out this new stuff, stuff that they're doing now, um, it was so easy to do it in color, you know, it was, it was no problem. And um, the cost, in, in the old days, it would be, maybe be um, four to seven or eight times the cost of black and white, mm -hmm. at least that. Yeah. Nowadays, they're doing the color almost for the same price as black and white. Is that right? Really. It's not, it's not much more. It's not, not a heck of a lot. Well, maybe before we leave today, I'll let you. I'll introduce you to our the lady that's the, uh, the president of the museum or whatever, and you know, Sharon McGuire, and you can, you know, I can show her what you're doing, and yeah. maybe you can just fill her in. Yeah. Chet, it's been great. <laughs> Thank you very I much. About, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, I think so. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah to see. <laughs> Okay. Is there, I, in I, closing, is there anything I, that you want to well, I, I sure hope that you had film in there, you know. <laughs> that's what happens. That's what happened to me of, not too often, but a couple of times when I was in the ad business, you know, we'd go out oh, and shoot some you, shots, yeah. <laughs> something, get back in that lab, and they didn't turn out at all. Oh, i got to go back there, and i got to get somebody back there. So yeah. I know a couple times what's happened is because I used to use, well, we were out in a bigger area, and so it was hard to pick up the sound because there was uh -huh. background, so I wanted to use lavalier mics. Uh -huh. But there's a little battery on those, so sometimes the people would didn't realize that they're not picking up any sound, yeah. so oh, yeah. everything looks great, but you don't hear anything. Yeah, right. So I've done away with that. I don't fool with that, cause, especially in here, because this mic picks it up fine, yeah. so I don't have to worry about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Make it as simple as possible. <laughs> well, I hope you give that a rough cut, and I mean really a <laughs> tough, tough, rough cut. No, 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 no. It's going, it's going in the can just the way it is. It's just Sorbacci was about 600. But uh, it's a fairly steep climb, but it's also all volcanic ash. And now we see that it's full of bomb craters.
which apparently were the result of the B-17 bombings of the island. And wherever they hid in this area, where the volcanic ash was, just left huge craters. These could be serious tank obstacles as well. We had these three damn things to worry about, plus the Japanese. So I sent, as I had on Saipan, I sent two three-man reconnaissance teams ashore with the first wave. We were to land between where the, the division was going in with two, two regimental combat teams abreast and one in, in, behind. It always was like an inverted triangle. The base of the triangle was up front, the apex was in the rear. So you had two regiments up front, one in, in reserve normally except Antinia, where we went in differently. But um, the, we were assigned to land where the two regimental combat teams joined and land after the third wave before the fourth wave. And there's about five minutes between waves. And they never knew for sure when the first wave was going to hit the beach, depending on a lot of circumstances, but it's usually set up for around 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, heavy bombardment going on from about 4 a.m. And uh, so we sent these two reconnaissance teams, of three men each, each with a corporal, with a walkie-talkie radio on my, geared to my command frequency. And they, uh, they were to, one, they were, well, their mission was immediately on landing, these were experienced tankers, to tell me on the radio, can we land there okay, or are we going to bog down? If it was the latter, they were, of course, to let me know that, and one team was to go to the right and one to the left and search for a suitable place where we could get ashore without bogging down. They, they, were to, they went with the first wave, and we were supposed to be in there about 15 minutes later behind the third wave. And uh, first thing that happened, the first wave hit almost immediately, I got the one and only message I received from them. For Christ's sakes, it was like this, it may have been a little different, but something like, for Christ's sakes, don't try to land here, you'll bog down. Don't land till you hear from us. Now, that was not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> but I never got another message. The second wave went in, the third wave went in, we're supposed to go in now, but I don't know what the hell to do most frustrating time of my entire life was then and for the next couple of hours. I remembered, I will always remember it as being the most frustrating experience I've ever had. It's obvious that we're needed ashore. It's also obvious that if we go in where we're supposed to go, we're not going to be able to accomplish much. Talking Bob Reed, who was my executive officer, is with the RCT commander, the Colonel Wensinger, who had command of the 23rd RCT. At this point, Louis Jones is now assistant division commander of the 1st Marine Division on, and, and had that job in the Okinawa campaign, which followed this by a month or so. Anyway, uh, Reed is with Wensinger, and Wensinger is telling Reed to tell me to get my tanks in as soon as I can. And I'm telling Reed what the situation is. <coughs> Finally, Reed and I jointly decide, I have no choice, just go in where we're supposed to go and hope for the best. <coughs> so we did. I told the skipper, we're, we're, another thing, I don't know if I mentioned this the other day, we're now not on board LCMs from a landing ship dock, which was the ideal way to go. <coughs> Instead, the Navy had come up with a new ship vessel called Landing Ship Medium. It was neither a ship nor a landing craft. It was a hybrid. We got on board this thing on Maui, and we're still on board it to get off on the beach of Iwo Jima. Only it took four of them for my company, so we're all broken up to four different vessels. They were, they, uh, they were like sort of like an LST, which you probably are familiar with. They had an open well deck, they were much smaller than an LST, and they would take six tanks in, in the column. And 
had 18 tanks if you include the tank retriever. So I had three of those. Plus I had a bunch of trucks, machine, machine shops and stuff on a fourth LSM with my company headquarters and my uh, first sergeant in charge. But the other three, the other two LSMs had platoon leaders of the second and third platoon and their platoons. Third platoon also had the tank retriever. And the first platoon had me besides it. So there were six tanks on each. The second platoon had Bob Reed's tank and somebody else was in it. Reed was with Colonel Wensing in the command boat. So we were uh, circling sort of out off the beach, well off the beach, wondering when we're going to go in. Finally, as I said, Reed and I jointly agreed we'd go in and try it. And I tell a skipper, whom I got to know pretty well by then, Chuck Haber was his name. He was a lieutenant commander. This is his first combat mission. I suggested that he go in to roughly where we were supposed to land, but ease in slowly because we may bog down and block the first tank might bog down and you're not going to be able to get the rest of the tanks off and you don't want to be broached high and dry with five tanks on board. So in his excitement we didn't go in slowly. We slammed into the beach. And now if the Japanese had up until that time not opened up with any of their anti-boat flat trajectory artillery because they didn't want to give their positions away until they had worthwhile targets. And we're a worthwhile target. We're, although we're small for a lotion going ship, we're damn big for a landing craft. <coughs> this LSM had no armor plate. And these high trajectory, these flat trajectory high, uh, high, 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 high velocity. High velocity, thank you. High velocity projectiles going in one side out the other before they explode. So we got a lot of holes all above the water line, but very little damage if any other than super superficial. But they really opened up on us. Now we hit the beach hard, the ramp is down, my tank rolls off and boom. We're right down in a hole in the volcanic edge. My gunner sergeant and I got out. The gunner sat on the edge of the turret so I could talk to the driver. I had the best tank driver in the battalion, and uh, he was damn good, but between he and Sam Johnson and I, and we each had shovels, we're digging and digging, and he's, we're telling him, the guy who's liaisoning between us, telling him, move it forward, move it back, whatever. But all we're doing is digging a bigger hole. The shells are landing all around us now, because we're the first tank to be there, and at least on that part of the beach. And, uh, but the volcanic ash, although it hurt us, it also saved us, I, I'm sure, because although it caused the tanks to bog down, which was terrible, it also caused the high-trajectory high water shells that they were floating all around us to bury themselves in the volcanic ash before they would explode. And so the you practically had to be hit by a mortar shell to be hurt by it. You could be standing, you could land here, and you could be here, and it wouldn't hurt you because the shrapnel, which normally went like that, was all in the volcanic ash. That, that's the only reason I can figure that Sam Johnson and I and the guy in the turret were never hurt. Anyway, we screwed around for about 10 minutes trying to get this tank out of the hole was just getting worse. So I told Reed, we're going to leave, we're going to abandon the tank, we're going to take the breech block of the gun, we're going to lock the tank, we're going to go back off the beach and look for another place to land, which is what we attempted to do, except the damn LSM is broached, just barely has propeller in water, and but the skipper he did a pretty skillful job. He eventually got us off the beach. In the meantime, about 20 or so badly wounded Marines have crawled aboard this LSM. And they, they, the 
whole idea of the, of the handling of the wounded on Iwo Jima, the plan was each battalion aid station was on an LST anchored several thousand yards off the beach with pontoons on the side. And the landing craft, as they re after they discharged Marines or cargo on the beach, were to take wounded back to the nearest aid station nearest LST that was anchored off there and there would be people there standing on the pontoons to lift the wounded off and enter the LST. So the skipper tells me, and I couldn't argue this, before he does anything else he's going to get these wounded marines back to an LST. So that took about a half an hour. We went back and I'm, I'm so frustrated. I, you know, talk about being between a rock and a hard place. This is it. I don't know what the hell to do. I want to get my tanks ashore where they're needed, and I don't know how that we're going to do it. Meanwhile, we unload the wounded, a couple of whom died en route, as I recall. Got the rest off, got them all off, even the dead ones, and headed back to the beach. Now, the skipper says, where do you think we should go? And I said, your guess is as good as mine. Just pick a spot, but ease into it this time. We're not going to run any tanks off until my gunnery sergeant and I have a chance to reconnoiter on foot. So he eased it in very slowly to some spot. I don't know where the hell we were, but it wasn't the same spot where we were originally. And Sam Johnson, the gunnery sergeant, and I got off with, with uh, shovels, and we're kind of digging around. And it's just as bad as where we bogged down before. We realized any tank that goes off the LSM is going to bog down at the edge of the ramp. And this was the, my, the point of my deepest frustration. It's hard for me to describe today how I felt then, except I was at wit's end. I didn't know what the hell to do. Just then, like manna from heaven, here comes Corporal Jewell running with a big grin on his face. He was the only survivor of the six-man reconnaissance, the two or three-man reconnaissance teams. He was the corporal in charge of one of them. He's the guy who called me, as I recall, on the phone, don't land here. But his, his uh, walkie-talkie had been shot out of his hand, and the other three, the other five guys were dead by this time. I didn't know it too well. But he said, he's running with a big grin, I've got a place where he can land, and the two places where you can get over these two terraces. I went from the lowest I've ever been in my life to the highest, I think, in just a flash of a couple of seconds. So I grabbed him, we went aboard the LSM, we backed, the skipper backed off, I took him up, uh, Jewel up to the bridge, and he showed the skipper exactly where to land. And meanwhile I radioed the, th the other two platoon leaders, besides the one who was with me, the two other LSMs on which I had my tanks, telling him exactly what we are going to do. We're going to land where Jewel said we can land in single file, and as soon as we were, we've landed, the second platoon is to come in immediately, and then the third platoon follows in our tracks. Don't move off them, because you can either bog down or hit a mine. Just follow us. And that's exactly what we did. We, we uh, Jewel ran off in front of my tank, uh, down the beach to the right, I'd say maybe 50 yards, and sure enough, there was a spot in the terrace that had been blown down by probably 16 or 14 inch naval gunfire so that a tank could clamber over it. Jewel climbed over it, we climbed over it, then we went back the other direction, maybe 50 or 60 more yards, and the second terrace had a spot just like that. Jewel climbed over that when my tank climbed over it. Meanwhile, it's kind of like a snake dance. The tanks are following in single file, and the Marines all over the place, some are dead and some are alive, some are advancing, some are not. We went on for a while where Jewel is now guiding us around these damn bomb craters. And we get to a point where I see the Marines, they're all around, are flat on their stomachs and they're not moving. And that can mean only one thing. If they do move, they're going to get shot. And we could, I could see about 200 yards ahead. It was hard to see him, but you, 
It's bottom, if you look carefully. Looking through my glasses through a periscope, there's a line of pillboxes about, I'd say, 50 to 75 yards between each pillbox. And I could see seven or eight of them spread across the whole front. They're low, they're not more than about so high above the volcanic ash. They're the same color as the volcanic ash. But they're up, the, the, the grade of the hill was about like this. And they're up here and we're about down here. They could not depress the tubes of their machine guns long enough to get to hit Marines who were hugging the deck at this point. But any Marine who stood up would get it. That's why they're all down the way they were. But this was this was heaven sent. Here again, like what I described on Saipan, we're 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 made for this kind of an operation. There's nothing in those pillboxes that could hurt us, and we had everything that could destroy them. And we immediately, through the radio, we got everybody doing what they were supposed to do. Find out the, the most devastating of all were the flamethrowers, I think. We only had three of them. And uh, Shutt, fortunately, got the best picture that he took during the whole war in his movie camera. The flame tank, one of them was right behind his tank. And this was later, I saw it for the first time, many years later, on Victory at Sea, or one of those types of programs. You could see the arc of this orange clubbed front flame going about 100 to 150 yards, hitting on a pillbox, going right inside the aperture. Coming out of the rear end of the pillbox were two Japanese, who were the two occupants of the pillbox. They said, we're going in this direction. The pillboxes are across here. They start running in this direction. Their, their shirts are flame. And you can see on the volcanic ash behind them, machine gun bullets that are just moving right, right behind them and up into them and down they went. Probably did before they ever hit the ground. But we spent about, I don't know how long, I don't even know what time of day it was, except it was still light. But we spent whatever time was necessary cleaning out these seven or eight pillboxes that were across the front that we were attacking. Then with the Marines who were on the ground, they got up and followed us up to the edge of the airfield. And by that time, it was getting dark. That was D-Day on the UAP. So you made it to the airfield? We made it to the airfield. And uh, the, uh, the very interesting event occurred the next day. If we have time, I can tell you about it. The, uh, we encountered for the first time the worst weapon that we would ever run into, the worst from our point of view, against us. The uh, Japanese had removed all of their airplanes that were not destroyed before we ever landed. But they had a hell of a lot of ammunition left, particularly aerial bombs. And had our landing been two or three weeks later, we may, might never have made it, in my opinion, because they didn't have time to complete what they started to do when they moved, moved their planes. They were creating minefields of aerial bombs buried vertically with a, uh, an anti-tank mine on the nose. The, the, this, would, this would be ground level. And uh, they had them, they were smart enough that they had a magnificent general commanding the Japanese. And he figured out the terrain was so terrible Tanks could only go in a few places, and those are the places he buried these mines. Except in the two airfields, tanks could easily go, and he didn't have time to put a minefield across both of them. He started, and uh, I had never heard anything about that, of course. The second morning on Iwo Jima, we're moving across the first airfield, tanks out in front, infantry right behind. And uh, where my tanks are in a 
in a line, and then in, he had a formation, sort of a shallow inverted V. And I would be at the center of the V, which gave me observation of all my tanks. If it were a straight line, some of them I couldn't see, so it was something like this. And we, we just started out, Japanese, the Marines behind us, one of my best friends, uh, Marine, uh, an infantry company commander, uh, was about 20 feet behind my tank as we're starting out. The mortar shell hit right next to him, and apparently he's now on the runway. If he'd been in the, in the volcanic ash, he might not have been killed. But this shrapnel just tore through him. I saw him looking at him, I saw it happen. Down he went, dead probably also before he hit the ground. But we're moving across the airfield. The Marines are taking a lot of fire. And we're looking for targets to fire at. Not too many, because you couldn't see these guys that are all on the ground. And all of a sudden, I hear and see a tremendous explosion. And it's the third tank to my right. It was part of the first platoon. Platoon Sergeant Bruno was in command, Joe Bruno. And I see, I've never seen this before or since for that matter. The turret went one way, the chassis went another, and a body flew out of the turret, landed about 30 feet away, which was Bruno, by the way, who survived. He's still alive. He had a fractured skull and a broken back, but he lived. And they rescued him, but there was, of the other four men in the tank, three were dead, but the gunner of that tank was still in the turret, but the turret rolled over his leg. He was pinned inside the turret with his leg partly sticking out, and of course in terrible, terrible pain, and uh, he's alive too. I'm going to have to stop this for a second. Sure.